All right, so um, I think we can get started. So thank you all so much for coming to the Dartmouth Investment and Philanthropy Program's first stock pitch competition by the DIP. Um, for a quick introduction, my name is Megan, and I'm joined by Brandon and Yizen in introducing today's events. Um, we're, we're representing the Dartmouth Investment and Philanthropy Program, or more often known as DIP, which is Dartmouth's largest undergraduate finance organization with over 150 members. Um, at its core, we're an investment fund managing over $700,000 of the Dartmouth endowment, but we also supplement Dartmouth's liberal arts curriculum by providing much of the pre-professional finance education on campus. We are incredibly thrilled to see the extensive participation in By the Dip this year with international participation from Hanover to California to Montreal, London, and Hong Kong. Um, we had over five, 500 entrants representing over 65 schools with more than 110 submissions. As our contestants know, we also hosted a tremendous amount of coffee chats for students at schools across the board, connecting with numerous professionals at our 16 sponsors. We thank you all for your amazing hard work and your submissions and appreciate your support of our first stock pitch competition. We hope that you've had a fun, enjoyable learning experience. Today, we'll be wrapping up our competition and our keynote speaker and our long awaited final round. We have four teams competing in the main finals as well as five in our freshman showcase round. And we're thrilled to see all the underclassmen participation and hope that this competition has provided opportunity for growth, feedback, and more. We have over $6,000 in prize funding that will be distributed to the finals pitch team, and we're very pumped to see all the pitches that are to come today. Before introducing our keynote speaker, we wanted to give a huge shout out to the many individuals and organizations who made this competition possible. First of all, we'd like to thank the Madison Center for Entrepreneurship at Dartmouth, which serves Dartmouth students, faculty, and alumni along the path from entrepreneurial thinking to entrepreneurial doing providing co-curricular education and experiences alongside a world-class alumni network. The Dartmouth Investment and Philanthropy Program had the fantastic privilege this year of joining Magnuson as an official student program, and our new partnership was critical to the success of this competition. Specifically, we'd like to thank Sarah Morgan, Jamie Coughlin, and the team at Magnuson for their help in coordinating with our sponsors. We would also like to thank the Dartmouth Office of the Provost and Mary Ella Zeitz who helped coordinate the logistics around the prize fund and contacting sponsors as well. Next, we'd also like to thank our 16 corporate sponsors, Apollo, Bank Capital, Blackstone, CC Capital, Citadel, Citadel Securities, CDNR, DE Shaw, Fidelity Investments, Morgan Stanley Investment Management, Palm Drive Capital, Sandler Capital Management, Silver Lake, Chuck Advisors, Warburg Pincus, and West Edge Global Investors. These partnerships would not be possible without the tireless work of our alumni and friends at these firms, and we're incredibly grateful for all of the guidance and help, and we think it's truly been a huge testament of the strong Dartmouth alumni network coming together in support of students pursuing finance. Additionally, we wanted to thank DIP's alumni board and network of alumni representing previous DIP members dating back to 2011 who have continued to provide guidance, help us find sponsors, and has seen the organization grow in terms of AUM, as well as in terms of education and much more. Additionally, we wanted to acknowledge our semifinal judges. We'd like to thank Brian Serwin from Riverstone, Jared Cole from Bain Capital, Bill Tsui from Citadel Securities, Kevin Frankfurt from Fidelity Investments, John Liu from Warburg Pincus, Eddie Ma from Susquehanna Investment Group, Zach Port from Blackstone, and Grant Shobar from Warburg Pincus. Our semifinal judges were crucial in the success of this competition, and the experience would not have been the same without their judging and critique. Last but not least, we'd like to thank DIP's investment committee and broader leadership team for their help in coordinating logistics and early round judging. <laughs> I know we have heard a little bit from Vito already, but I would like to officially introduce our keynote speaker, Vito Menza. Vito works at Sandler Capital as an assistant portfolio manager for Sandler's long and short equity strategy, assisting the founder, Andrew Sandler, in portfolio construction, position sizing, hedging, overall risk management, and more. Sandler Capital has $1.8 billion of asset under management, and they consistently produce results in both their hedge fund as well as in their private equity fund. 
Project John Lee Sandler, Vito worked at Goldman Sachs in the hedge fund research sales division right before graduating from Dartmouth with majors in economics and environmental studies. We had the pleasure of meeting Vito through a guest lecture in our macroeconomics class, and we're thrilled to welcome him back to talk more about his career path as well as his investing advice. If you have any questions during the keynote address, please input them in the Q&A box and we can get them to you live and for Vito to answer. With that in mind, we would love to welcome Vito Mensa. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. It's really quite an honor. Um, and you all should be extremely proud of what you've put together. Uh, it really is quite a feat for, for anyone, let alone undergraduates. And uh, it really warms my heart to see it. And uh, you should all, everybody should really give you guys all a round of applause because it's tremendous what you put together. Oh, we appreciate the note, Vito. And, you know, all of this wouldn't have been possible without your support. And, you, you know, we're glad you're speaking to us at this event. And I guess we want to start off and to learn a little bit more about you. We gave a short bio and introduction, but we definitely want to hear from you yourself, you know, a little bit about your background, how you got to Sandler, and why you chose Hedge Fund to start out your investing career. Sure. Um, I'm happy to give you like a nice walkthrough of my um, sort of why, why I started in this business, how I got started. Um, maybe, may, may, maybe have a few laughs along the way because there are definitely some funny parts. Um, so really, back when I was in high school, uh, I always just had an affinity for stocks. Um, not, not, not being anywhere near as sophisticated as some of these pitches that I've, that I've seen. But, you know, when I was in high school, I graduated in 2000 and I remember trading, uh, my, uh, my merit, my Ameritrade account back then in the, uh, in the school library using, you know, it was a big deal because it was a T1 connection. So I think you got something like a hundred pips per, you know, per second, or, or maybe it was 56, whatever the number was. And it was the fastest computer in the school. Um, and so every, you know, lunch I'd leave and I'd go and I'd be you know, day trading, thinking I was some sort of a whiz, uh, who was able to basically, uh, you know, pick any stock and it was going up and everything was great. Um, and I did have a passion for it. I did enjoy it. I think, you know, they say, they always say, um, <laughs> sometimes they ring bells at tops and maybe one of the bells that, that should have been a bell for, for me, but it was a lesson that I've learned that's helped me in my investment career because I remember my senior year, I was, I think I was taking a test uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a calculus class and I got over the loudspeaker, uh, rang out, Vito Menza, please go to Mr. John Kowalik's office. Vito Menza, please to Mr. Kowalik's office, who was the headmaster, the principal. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, I'm like, I don't think I did anything wrong recently. What could this be about? And uh, you know, he called me in his office and uh, he showed me a stock chart of the stock that I recommended to him. He's like, should I take profits now? So that was probably, if that, was, if that wasn't the bell going off that, uh, that this thing was a bubble about to pop, I, I don't know what was. Of course, I didn't recognize it at the time. Of course, I got hurt like anyone else, um, but it was a great, it was a great learning experience. Um, so I, I graduated, I went to Dartmouth and I remember, um, you know, wanting to wanting to do finance, wanting to get involved with a hedge fund, not really completely sure what it was. Um, I sort of knew the distinction between a private equity fund and a hedge fund. Uh, and just like you're hosting this contest now, uh, a firm by the name of Carrot Capital, back when I was a freshman at Dartmouth, um, did a private equity competition where they went out to schools much the same way you all are. Um, and it was sort of ingenious. Um, went out to colleges, it was graduate and undergraduate both, and you submitted business plans. And it was a gentleman by the name of David Galepter, um, who his pedigree was, he sold Carson, which was a financial information firm, started Cara Capital, and went to schools, and he was looking for response, uh, basically liaisons, um, to collect and, you know, to be the boots on the ground and to promote this business plan. And there was no age restriction. Um, you know, you didn't have to be a, a senior. Or, so as a freshman, this was sort of my way to, to, to I thought, to, to get in. So I volunteered to be, uh, to be the liaison. I wrote a, you know, like a little essay or something. I don't think, I'm not even sure anybody else saw it on the bulletin board. I don't think there was competition. And they, they picked me to do it. Um, you know, in my family's background, my dad's a dentist, my mom, um, got her law degree, but wound up never actually practicing. And so I didn't really have any connections into the, um, in, onto Wall Street. Um, so this was sort of my idea when I was a freshman. I said, well, 
I'm going to promote this program and I, I would love an internship. So I, uh, I cold called the company, um, which is based in Manhattan, um, you know, and said, hey, thank you very much for picking me. I'm really excited. Um, and, and basically worked my way to getting David Galepter on the phone, uh, the CEO of the company, and sort of pitched him on myself um, that I wanted to be an unpaid intern for him. And, you know, I think he was, I think he chuckled a bit that I got him on the phone and then I was sort of selling myself and he gave me a shot and it was nice to, to get that chance. Um, and I learned a ton. It was all private. Um, he actually did wind up paying me at the end, which was totally unexpected, but that was sort of my first break into to finance and investing. And what was nice about it was coming at it from the private side, you know, I, I really learned an appreciation for how to value an asset. Uh, something that I think, unfortunately, um, and, I'm, and I'm, we all have biases, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of biased to how markets are behaving recently and, you know, with the advent of crypto and how I see a lot of people thinking that, you know, stocks or assets are all about you know, hype and popularity um, and, and just about really liquidity and money flow, which, you know, I don't want to minimize liquidity and mon money flow. But at the end of the day, ultimately, it's going to come down to the value of the asset and how to value it and whether or not it pays you, uh, you know, a, a, a hypothetical discounted stream of earnings associated with it. Um, and that's something that, unfortunately, I don't I don't see um, a ton of appreciation for this contest. I feel like uh, really, really kind of breathes some some fresh life into that. And that's what makes me so proud of you all for doing it um, makes me feel old. <laughs> because I feel like, and, and, you know, I'm also seeing things now very similar to what I saw in 2000. Um, and I know a lot of money managers maybe don't remember 2000 or, you know, weren't trading stocks in high school back then. Um, but I see some of the same things going on where it's about, you know, about popularity and hype and not enough focus. I, I didn't know how to do it, but I was the same way back then. Um, but I learned and not enough focus on the underlying asset quality. Um, so anyway, so that was my first sort of, I'm, the best, I'm, I'm diverging, but that was my sort of, the way that I broke in um, to, to Wall Street was that internship. Um, after that, uh, I, I joined SLK. Um, you know, it was easy, it was easier once you had that private equity background on your resume to then um, apply to Spear, Leeds and Kellogg, um, which at the time was going through a merger with Goldman Sachs. This was in the uh, in the downturn. So I think it was 2002. I might be getting my years a little confused. I think it was 02. Um, and they basically weren't getting many internships. Uh, I think at SLK, I was maybe one of two or three interns. It was very, very, uh, they didn't have many. Um, I spent some time on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I also spent time uh, in corporate relations. And Goldman Sachs was nice enough to bring us handful of interns over, I was a sophomore, um, into their sort of internship program as well, and get that, that back then there was a lot of training done to the intern class. Um, my junior year then, uh, I became a full intern at Goldman Sachs. Again, coming from Spearley's and Kellogg, which was bought by Goldman, it was sort of my way into there. Um, <clears throat> this was in 03, vigorous, vigorous training. There was only 20 interns because the market was uh, really in, in starting to emerge from what was a really nasty, nasty bear market, um, which to me rings a lot, very similarities to what's happening right now, frankly, um, which we could talk about, you know, if you want my outlook. Um, but long story short, uh, Goldman Sachs trained me um, as an intern. Uh, they offered me a position uh, full time for when I for when I was graduating Dartmouth, which was made my senior year at Dartmouth like that much better. That was great to have that sort of after my junior summer. Um, and but then by the time I joined Goldman, the desk that hired me um, it was called a catalyst team. We were basically supposed to, it was a team of like eight or nine people. Um, you sat between research, you basically sat between research sales and the analysts sort of, and you interacted direct with hedge fund clients. At the time, so we were interacting with some of the biggest, biggest name hedge funds um, back then. And you were sort of acting like you're as your own desk analyst. You were coming up with your own timely ideas, catalyst team, because they were supposed to have a catalyst. And I just remember it was the coolest thing ever. Um, but also, you could probably think that there was some inherent, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe some inherent conflict of interest, because you had your Goldman Sachs analysts who are publishing, re you know, publishing research analysts, and you were sort of acting like your unpublished, um, you know, own desk analyst. 
So I think it might have pissed off some of the senior analysts when they would make a call and we were like, yeah, that's a terrible call. You know, go the other way. Um, so, I, but at the end of the day, when I when I st- when I joined Goldman, that that desk actually got dissolved. Uh, but they obviously they honored my um, they honored their commitment to me. Um, they um, uh, they hired me as part of hedge fund research sales. Um, uh, the training back then was tremendous, and you were sort of brought on as as an analyst, uh, an analyst in the equities division, and they really trained you. Um, bought in a ton of financial outside financial consultants. Uh, we took tests. It was like back then. It was really like grad school, um, like getting your master's of finance almost. Uh, and I'm grateful for Goldman for, for having done that. Um, but I also knew that I didn't want to be really in a sales role uh, per se. Um, I wanted to be picking stocks. I wanted to be where the action was. I wanted to, I wanted to take risk. I wanted to manage and take risk ultimately. And so I was in discussions with my clients who were hedge funds and uh, Andrew Sandler back then, um, you know, we, we were in touch and he met me and he, and he stole me away from Goldman um, in 2006. I joined Sandler Capital then. I joined as, uh, as sort of the same role I was doing at Goldman, sort of a catalyst screener, uh, desk analyst for Andrew. And um, we, we, we did really well in, in 07. We protected really well in 2008. We came very close to making money in 08, even running a net long book. Um, I remember at the time going through you know, 10Ks and 10Qs and, and pulling out who had you know, all day paper that they were marking close to par, meaning close to, a, close to f- full value when the reality of the mortgage paper was it was trading in the open market for like 40 cents and a dollar. Um, I mean, it was a company, Lumina Mortgage, I remember back then. It was, it was a mortgage REIT with a ton of Florida Alt-A paper. Um, and, and they were marking it to model as opposed to marking it to market. So they would come out with all these great earnings and really they were insolvent at the end of the day. And, and you knew that. And so, you know, we, we were looking for those opportunities constantly, never really knowing how bad uh, the, the market was going to get or how close to the brink things really got, but paying close attention to the credit markets um, really as our, as our eyes and ears. And so that was real, that, that was sort of my, my background and my, and my role, um, you know, cutting my teeth, if you will, in the industry. Um, uh, you know, Andrew made me a partner after that year, um, quickly made me the number two partner. And I've, I've been the assistant portfolio manager since I think 2010. And so we have one main fund, um, the thing that makes our fund a little bit unique is, and, and where I, you know, I, I use my, my macroeconomic background from Dartmouth every day, um, is uh, we, we really take a view of the macro picture as well, even though we're doing a lot of bottoms up and, um, and, uh, and stock specific analysis as well. And so we sort of incorporate the two uh, and into our investment analysis and, and create what we try to be a, a, an uncorrelated return stream for our investors. Um, so that's, that's sort of my, it's my background. Um, I don't know if there's any lessons from it. I would just say, if, if this is what you want to do, think out of the box, don't ever get discouraged. I mean, I, I tried for other internships before I had, you know, um, the, um, the CARA capital one. Um, so that, yeah, let me pause there and, and ask what other, what other questions you have for me. Yeah, thank you for your story, Vito. It's definitely very inspiring and definitely a long journey from invest, investing, you know, high school all the way to, you know, as the assistant portfolio manager now. But I wanted to ask you a little bit more about themes. And I know it's something that a lot of the participants are likely interested in. In this current macroeconomic environment where there's, you know, stagflation, the Fed is raising rates and, you know, economists are saying recession is inbound. What are your views on the market? And I guess, you know, how... Do you pick stocks in this current environment where everything is jumping up and down? Yep. Um, this is a difficult, this is a difficult environment. It's it's in some ways, it's a lot more difficult than than 2008. Um, I think the backdrop that you have to acknowledge and, and have some humility with it is you know, we're living in unprecedented times. Um, you know, you look at you look at what's happened with money supply and and how you know during the pandemic. Our Fed really took the training wheels off. Um, you know, they, they learned what QE was um, during the global financial crisis of 08. They got comfortable doing it, and then they amplified it literally times 10. Uh, and and you know, at the same time, there was massive fiscal stimulus. So we did, we essentially did, you know, MMT, uh, 
printed money and, and the Fed, sorry, the, the fiscal fiscal stimulus at the same time, you know, the Fed basically monetized the debt by printing money. Money supply numbers, you know, if you look at M2 growth or just look at absolute stock of M2, it's, it's you know, it, it went hockey stick through the roof. And, you know, um, you, you created inflation, in my view, twofold. One was, one was inflation that really was just from um, a supply chain is being distorted and and uh, a lot of a lot of inefficiencies that were created during the pandemic. Um, the other part of it, though, was you know what Milton would say is it was just for money supply and, and what was done with it. Um, and at the same time, you know, fiscal stimulus wouldn't have been as as effective if rates were allowed to rise. But because they monetized the debt and held rates low, there was no, in my view, there was no um, there was no governor. And so all this money got got thrown into uh, uh, into not only consumers but the government's hands, and the amount of spending um, uh, and the inflation impulse that came from it, uh, we're still we're still shaking off. And you know when I look at sort of where we are now, and, and I think about where we are in a cycle, um, you know last year at least as far as markets went, it was all about interest rates and it was all about your valuation, and you know it was about High multiple stocks because interest rates went up, got hit, and low multiple stocks, they held in okay. Um, companies' earnings are, are denominated in nominal. You know, if you look at GDP, um, nominal GDP is still high, and so that benefits companies' earnings. Um, now we've gone through, um, you know, what's, what's still one of, the, one of the most dramatic tightening cycles in history, um, the first time ever money supply is ticked red in the month of December. You, you get the money supply numbers a month later. So a lot of the liquidity is being taken away as the Fed does QT um, and raises rates. But at the same time, the amount of money they pumped in the system, there's still remnants from it. So we're still working that off. And so last year was about multiple damage to a company. This year, and I think into 20 into 24 is going to be about the ramifications of taking out that liquidity. And even though the markets feel like for now they're celebrating um, what's a decline in inflation. And, and when you look at how inflation is starting to decline, you know, for the first, it, the, we're really just working off base effects. In other words, tough, there's really difficult comparisons because, you know, inflation went crazy for uh, in the first half of 2022. And so some of these things really were pandemic related, supply chain related, um, and that's falling off. But at the same time, you know, if you look at some of the mistakes that were made, uh, like in 1967 or in periods in the 70s, um, uh, uh, inflation will come back. And so I think, you know, the question with the Fed is, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of starting to back off the rhetoric uh, the the Paul Volcker rhetoric, if you will, uh, although we'll see what Powell says next week. Um, but they're backing off the rhetoric uh, of of no, we're gonna we're gonna really we want to we want to really make sure that we hammer this thing. Um, and I, I understand why they are because inflation is looking like it's not going to be a problem if you project out, um, you know, some of these month on month numbers that we're getting. The real question is what's it going to look like in the back half of this year, um, and uh, and and do you and does it really lie dormant? And if markets, i.e. we call them financial conditions, it's just a fancy word for everything from stock market to credit markets to energy prices, we call them financial conditions. And there's an index you could follow. If you Google it, there's one on Bloomberg, financial conditions index. If financial conditions keep loosening, getting easier, it's going to be really difficult to, to beat inflation in a sustained way. Um, and that's sort of been one of the keys to the Fed's language is in a sustained manner to get it back down to 2%, not just touch it or go below it and then, you know, rip right back above it. And so that's sort of the what I think is going to be the, one of the difficulties um, if markets do rebound and the economy doesn't uh, go into a, go into a, a nasty recession. Um, but the other part of this is if you look at the amount of tightening that's been done already, and we sort of look at leading indicators as a way to forecast what's going to happen uh, in the economy. It's kind of core to economics. Um, all the leading indicators that we look at, some of them anybody can follow, right? You look at the PMIs. Um, they're really saying that something nasty is coming and that there will be a price to pay for this in terms of corporate earnings. And it's just, it's just not getting, it's not happening yet. Um, 
But in the back half of the year, um, all these things happen on a lag. So the tightening the Fed's already done happens on a lag, uh, potentially into 24. So the market right now seems to be really um, rallying and looking at kind of the current snapshot, right? And not projecting as much in the future. Or look, the, I, I want to be honest, there, there's a chance that this is really different this time around. And maybe the market knows best. Uh, and we really did get through the worst of this thing. Uh, and the market knows that, you know, uh, inflation is licked. We are going to have a soft landing. The Fed, you know, really treaded the, threaded the needle perfectly. I'll just tell you, history says that 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 that's history says the odds are against that. Um, so I think I look. I think this year is going to be a tough year. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to go through very distinct phases. Um, I don't think you've seen the damage yet in corporate earnings. I think that's coming. Um, I think market participants, myself included, um, we've all sort of got used to. Uh, recessions where you know you're running headfirst into a brick wall, like 2008. That was a credit recession, right? That was a nasty credit crunch. Um, everything stopped on a dime, uh, and so the recession hit hard and fast. And and you know in in 2020, March 2020, it was the world stopped because of COVID. So you know credit followed. Everything was shut down. I mean the economy was in a recession. Um, again, it happened sort of instantaneously. This time around, it feels like it's more of a slow dance or a slow moving car crash uh, in, in, into recession. And we'll see, there's always that chance that, they, that this time around it's gonna be different at all these leading indicators that in every other business cycle are gonna be proven wrong this time. Um, again, there's, there's the, the, remember that money supply and this experiment that was done, um, maybe it makes it different this time around. Um, so that's sort of my my opinion is even though things feel okay right now, um, consumers are having some relief from the from the inflation. Um, gasoline prices have cooperated. Oil prices have cooperated. Natural gas prices have cooperated. We've had a really warm winter, uh, not only in Europe but here in, here in the states. I mean, I'm, I'm in a short sleeve shirt. It's 55 degrees uh, here in New Jersey in the middle of late January. Um, so all these things have created sort of. Uh, business activities is, is strong because there's not a winter freeze going on. So it's created this near-term situation where near-term data that we look at, real-time economic data is holding in uh, better than expected right now. But it doesn't mean it's going to be like that uh, in, 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 in three or even six or 12 months from now. Yeah, that sounds good. And definitely a bit of a gloomy picture of, you know, recession, inflation, and everything in between. And I wanted to follow up with a more specific question. So DIP is a long-only fund, and this competition was designed to be a long-only competition. I know Sandler is a long-short fund, but in your view, in this current market where earnings are you know, going to be beat in this year, if PE ratios are being compressed and you know the rest of the market has very uncertain about you know whether the macroeconomics is headed towards inflation or you know towards a deep, dark recession, in between all those things, if you were to long a sector or stock, what are some trends that you will identify or look into and follow in order to make these bets? Yeah, I, if I was if I was if I was a long only, which you know, I'll be honest, we I, we try to think like long only managers, even though we sort of are, are you know move take a more real time view. Um, I think some of the things you have to remember is um, demographically the backdrop in this country is strong is good. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want you to, I don't want to paint this picture of this deep, dark 1970s. I think our Federal Reserve, while I don't agree with everything they're doing or have done, uh, but I, I do think that they're acutely aware of the issues of stop and go. And so I don't think you're going to have a 10 year cycle of go nowhere and those mistakes are, I, I don't think those, I think, I don't think those same mistakes will be repeated over and over again. It's not to say they might, they might misjudge something uh, and, and have to alter course, but that's the good news. What I would look for um, is I would still look for companies where you believe there's something fundamental about the company uh, that is making it do better than its peers. There's something secular about it, uh, or even if it's a cyclical company, um, you know, maybe I wouldn't chase it because cyclicals have been acting really, really well. Believe it or not, cyclicals have been acting well since September of, of last year. So if this is a bear market rally, you got to be careful chasing a cyclical here. That said, you know, have some dry powder. Uh, if there's something you think is, is a secular winner within a cyclical sector, you know, that's okay. Put, put some money to work. 
Um, and if it, if by the dip, if it, if it dips and you still feel good about it, you know, go for it. Um, right now, I, I would also be looking at certain sectors and certain companies that you think have a better chance of controlling their own destiny. I would look for factors like quality. Um, the way we measure quality right now, uh, it's had its worst start ever, uh, believe it or not, um, which to a year, um, which, 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 uh, you know, I, I don't think now's the time to give up on quality. It actually really underperformed last year as well, because last year was more about multiples and valuation and quality should start to act better as it becomes more about the economy and as it becomes more about who's going to make their earnings, who's going to miss their earnings. Um, so I would look at focus on quality. And what I mean by that are companies that have efficient but strong balance sheets. You don't want to have a, an over leveraged balance sheet um, going into a potential downturn when credit markets can start to widen um, and when um, uh, credit spreads start to widen. Uh, meaning, meaning credit gets harder and harder and you have, companies have to pay up for credit. So I focus on free cash flow. I would focus on, the big thing I would also focus on is make sure you're not investing in companies that are over earning uh, from a margin perspective. Because what happens when there's inflation is companies that um, are able to pass through the inflation, um, a lot of times their earnings get artificially inflated and get high. And if we could all agree that by hook or crook, uh, either the Fed is going to attack inflation uh, or we're going to have a nasty downturn uh, at some point that's going to take care of inflation. Um, you don't want to be in one of those companies whose margin structure uh, is, is bloated and they're over earning from inflation. That's something we're paying a lot of attention to. Companies are looking to short, not where we think there's going to be a lot of revenue misses. It's where we think the margin structure was too good and they're making a mistake because they're either investing too heavily, thinking the margin are going to stay there forever um, you know, and, and not recognizing that their own margins are, are, are way out of whack to historic. Um, so that's something I, I would look for. Um, look for somebody whose margin structure is not over earning into a downturn. Um, that's really, uh, you know, and, and make sure you believe in the management team, maybe is the last thing. I know, I know it may be difficult um, as students to get access to management teams, but you, you want a management team who you feel like um, is reliable in, 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 in a downturn and going to make the right moves. And if you don't get a great, and if you don't get a downturn and the Fed sticks to landing, great. Those, those companies are still going to do well uh, over, over a long-term horizon, even though in the short term, the lower quality companies, uh, the first move up, whether it's a bear market rally uh, or whether it's the first move out of a slowdown uh, or, or out of a recession scare, it's always low quality that moves first. But later on, whether it's a, whether you do go into a recession or it, the cycle continues, uh, high quality companies start to outperform. You're not going to get hurt with them. Thank you for that detailed response. I think those are definitely takeaways that we could all use. Um, another question that we had is about something that as students, we don't get much exposure to, which is risk management, um, position sizing, things of that nature, which hedge funds are uh, specialize in, but as students, we don't really get exposure to. So could you talk a little bit about how you think about um, how big your positions are, what risk you're taking, and how you're timing the market in general? Yeah, this is a subject we can spend a lot of time on, but I'm going to give just a very quick answer is, um, and everybody does it differently, we tend to be incrementalists um, to position sizing. And so within our sort of investment framework, we think of it as, we think of it as four boxes, um, we think of it as the macro, we think of it as a theme or trend, we think of it as a company specific analysis, and then we think of it as valuation. And just long story short, when we have all four of those boxes are sort of all checked and aligned, that's when you have your, your biggest positions. And when you start to lose a box or all not all four boxes are aligned, we, we, we put smaller positions. And in general, we're incrementalist. So if we're learning a new company and the analyst has done the, original, done the work, and we've asked all the questions, and now it's time to start a position. You know, he's encouraged, or he, him or her is encouraged to continue to do the work, uh, to continue to. We want to see proof. We want to see the technicals are proving that we're right. We want to see proof in the company's numbers. We want to see maybe proof in other of the company's customers. And that's how we'll size up. So at the end of the day, we're just trying to create a portfolio where our best risk adjusted returns are our top positions. And then we have a bunch of positions um, that are on the bottom. 
uh, that are either being built up or on their way or just sized down for a reason. And we're constantly sort of trading the portfolio along those lines. Um, so the analogy is we like to sort of like, you know, we, 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 we exchange, you know, messages, then we go on a date, then maybe we get engaged, then we get married, then we get divorced, then we get engaged again. So we're trading the position sizes up and down. That makes a lot of sense, Vito. Thank you so much. And it's something, you know, us Dip as a fund thinks all a lot about. You know, we invest in over 20 stocks right now at the moment, and we're constantly switching between dry powder as well as stocks themselves. So it's good advice that we can move on to and take into granted for our own club. But, you know, with that in mind, I want to ask you for advice, you know, with a lot of us going to invest in rows, you know, either this summer or in the upcoming years. I know there are a lot of people in the call that are interested in finance and definitely want investing rows in hedge funds or in investment banking. So for a young analyst walking to Wall Street, what are some advice you would have, you know, for yourself, you know, back in 2004 or, you know, for us now? Um, I think one of the things that I learned was as much as you think you may know, you don't know a lot. And I think that's something I learn every day. And the second you think you know more than the market, it's probably time for you to retire. Um, so I think it's, because that means you're, you're, you're washed up. Um, so I think the reality is um, constantly, you know, things are always different. Not You can make good risk adjusted bets, but you have to also recognize when your risk adjusted bet is not paying off. Um, and so that advice goes for, I think anybody, um, but especially for me, I thought, you know, when I first joined Goldman, I thought I was just like, you know, a little hot shot who traded stocks in college and in high school. And, you know, and, and there's so much I didn't know. Um, and I still continue to realize that like every day, but especially as a young person. And it was to see people that I thought were really good at what they do and to try to learn from them and, and what made them good. And, and that would be my advice is just, you know, just just have that have that hunger, but also have that humility and just kind of know what you don't know. Great. Thank you. And in your keynote speech so far, you touched a lot about reflecting on, upon previous trends and tying them to similarities that you see today. And one of them that you mentioned was the similarity between 2000 and the present. Could you talk a little bit about the similarities and differences you see there in the stock market yeah. and whether you think this is going to play out the same way over the next few years? So if you look at 2000 and you know, Andrew was, treated, was running the fund through it back then. And, um, you know, I was tangentially aware of it, but hearing what he had to say about it, um, it started off very similar in nature. It started off with, with, a, with a tech bubble, okay? Even though I don't think this time around um, tech was as egregious, but there were certain pockets within tech uh, that were pretty egregious, even though a lot of the other companies, it was, it was more, it was real. It wasn't just pie in the sky, but there was plenty of companies that were just stories, burned, burned a ton of cash flow. Um, um, the mem stock phenomena, which still seems like it still hasn't completely gone away today. Um, that to me is almost the equivalent of the chat boards. It existed back then. Um, just It just wasn't as in your face. You know, Now it's a lot easier to access. But the, the, the message boards, the hyping of stocks that have not a lot of, no fundamentals uh, uh, behind them. Um, Crypto, I think, is is also sort of maybe where the real egregious part of this of this um, of this cycle was. Whereas in 2000, it was really IPOs and tech IPOs um, that didn't have any real fundamentals. But you know, I'm not going to sit here and debate crypto. All I'm going to say is I can't value it because it doesn't have a, a cash flow associated with it. Um, and you could say that Bitcoin is digital gold, and, and I'm not going to argue with that. But I know that the other thousand coins that had no prospects for anything that popped up uh, and that were being you know, just traded on hype, that to me was very similar to some of the penny stock stuff and the NASDAQ that was going on in 2000. Remember, when the bubble burst, you will, I'll, I'll tell, tell you, when the bubble burst in 2000, it was the same way that happened last year, where it was tech stocks and high multiples that took the brunt. In fact, if you look back last year, if you look at um, 2000, bank stocks, small regional banks, the Russell 2000 did fine, did better. Uh, and then it was, believe it or not, in 2001, January was a big rebound in the markets and in NASDAQ, uh, just like this January is. So I, we'll see. And then, uh, and then it started to fall apart because then what happened was it started to impact the real economy. And so then just in, in 2001 into 02, 
um, you got economic damage. And then it spread beyond just valuation and the NASDAQ stocks, and it spread into companies that were economically sensitive. And I don't know, let's see if, if that's what happens. I'll tell you, um, in, in 2001, the Fed was cutting rates okay, aggressively, and they're still raising them right now. So, you know, that, that, that's a bit of a scarier prospect potentially, but at the same time, we also started from a much higher place in terms of consumers with savings uh, and in terms of money supply figures. So I, I don't know how those two things are gonna, are gonna cancel each other out. All right. Thank you, Vito, so much for, you know, your talk about all of these things. We want to open up the, you know, to Q&A, allow any participants to ask questions to Vito, whether it's about market, investing advice, you know, what you want to do as an analyst, anything, we're open to hear it. Yeah, uh, we have one in the chat. Uh, it's current uh, for, for Vito. It's asking for some contrast views that you have on stocks or sectors that you hold today in the current market environment? I can't really mention stocks because my, my compliance officers, you know, that was one of the things she asked me when I, when I got this cleared was, was not to mention any specific positions that we have. Um, I think, I think, I think just in general, our, our view that's a big contrarian right now is uh, we still don't think there's enough evidence of a, of a sustainable soft landing. Um, and so you know, what does that mean? That means that we're, we're taking short positions in um, certain in certain financial companies um, where we think uh, there's going to be credit damage uh, yet to come, that we think there's some complacency, specifically in certain parts of consumer finance. Um, I, you know, probably might be early, but I think that's going to be an area where um, people were concerned about it last year. Now the market's sort of blowing the all clear signal, or, or we think it's giving a false signal. Um, and we still think that there's going to be uh, a price to pay, unfortunately, with the consumer um, and, 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 and how that translates into certain subprime consumer finance exposed companies. That makes sense. And we have another question that's more specific to the career path rather than the market. So um, one, one participant is asking, why exactly do you decide to spend a career in hedge funds and the public market rather than in the private market? And what do you think is the different types of people that should spend careers and personalities that should spend careers in public versus private market? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I wonder all the time, Matt, why did I go, why did I do the private market where, uh, it's all mark to model, and you have a lot more a lot more time um, for things to play out. Um, I think if I think if I think the reality is if you're uh, a pro both both ways you have to be able to analyze a company. Um, I think unfortunately something that's been frustrating uh, is is in the public markets. Um, you know this this money flow and this and this sort of this um, whether it's mem stock phenomena or retail traders and. You know they they move markets and um, you know it's you could sit there and poo poo it but it's just a reality that public markets have to have to deal with and uh, I think you have to have maybe thicker skin to be to be in the public markets uh, and you have to be sort of willing to deal with that noise that's out there that that you know there's a lot of quantitative funds that run AI programs that are investing um, not looking at fundamentals and so at least one of the things I know has been frustrating for us at least. Uh, is having to deal with that when we think our investment view is going to be correct, having to deal with the noise in between has been difficult. And I think another part of that question was, yeah, how would you weigh the decision between spending a career in long only versus a long short hedge fund? Yeah, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's, I know people that have done both. Um, either way, you have to think like an investor. I mean, when you think, when you're shorting something, you're just thinking the opposite, like a mutual fund investor, right? And that's, you know, may, maybe hedge fund, you could be a little more short-term catalyst oriented. You don't have to be. Um, so I don't think there's, I don't think there's a much of a decision difference. I would say mutual funds are probably a lot less volatile in terms of career path, a um, little more security. Hedge funds, you know, they come and go. Um, so, you know, you can make a lot of money quicker. Um, and um, so, I don't know what one's probably a little more steady Eddie and one's a little more volatile. 
That makes sense. And in terms of the long term and stuff, just the volatility, one participant asked what would be, you know, be the traits of a good long term investor in the long run, rather than just someone that, you know, makes money one day and then loses it all the next day. I mean, <clears throat> history will be the judge, right? I mean, if you're going to be a long term investor, you have to be patient. But at the same time, I think you also have to recognize when something's wrong in your thesis. Um, <clears throat> Long-term investor could have more of a buy the dip mentality, I think, um, but you also better be darn sure that you're not missing something where there's some massive secular headwind. Uh, and it's not just market volatility or economic volatility where there's something wrong in the business model. So I think you, know, you have to be a little more maybe self-reflective to really be able to say whether or not this is just the market, this is just the economy, as opposed to there's something wrong with, with this company. And a follow-up to this question would be, you know, when you're looking at these long-term trends and you have long the stock and you're waiting for it to go up, how do you constantly check to make sure the stock that you have picked, you know, hasn't corroded in value or the fundamentals have changed? How do you, you know, balance that between, you know, finding new assets to purchase versus making sure and maintaining your current assets? I mean, the same way we do it is the same way, you know, anybody else, even if you're just an individual investor, um, make sure you follow the earnings calls, listen to the extent you have access to sell side research. If you don't have internal research, you know, analysts internally, um, you know, read sell side notes. You, there's services that anybody can subscribe to to get, you know, sell side Wall Street research. Um, just keep your eyes and ears open. Don't be afraid to open up a 10K or a 10Q. Um, I knew before I knew what they, you know, oh my gosh, the SEC filings are so intimidating. Anybody can read them. They're not that intimidating. They're very self-explanatory. The first one or two that you read is going to take you time, but read and, and the language is all there, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and lastly, just use your intuition of what you're seeing in, in the world. I can't tell you how many investment ideas we've had is just based on an interaction that we've had um, with our own everyday experience. Um, and then we do the work on it. And one other question we received, um, this attendee is asking, are there any resources you recommend for learning more about investing or certain sources that you read for um, gaining news on companies or industry trends? I, you know, it's, I, I wish I had a better answer because I could have told you 20 years ago what I would use, but it's changed. There's so many more things available. I'm not, I would use Yahoo Finance back, back when I was, you know, in high school and, um, in college, but there's so much, so many better tools. We're, we're using, we're using. Look, as a hedge fund, uh, we, we have access to to a lot of institutional tools that the average person is not going to have. Um, but that said, I know there's a lot of services. I would just say, look, be careful with stuff like Seeking Alpha. Some of it's good, some of it's garbage. People have agendas on those. Uh, I would be very careful with a lot of the um, the free sites that you see pop up where people are publishing things. A lot of it's false. Um, the whole mem stock phenomenon, there's a lot of misinformation around that it kind of blows my mind. The SEC doesn't crack down on it more, um, but it is what it is. Um, just be very careful of that kind of stuff. Wall Street Journal, reputable source, even watching Bloomberg TV or CNBC, that, that, that kind of thing is, is, I think is only going to help. Um, Mike, I would just be really cautious about what you find on the internet because a lot of it's just lies, hype, garbage, um, people trying to do pump and dumps. It's, I've I, I, like I said, I haven't seen it this bad uh, since, since 2000. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any final questions before we move on? Awesome. Um, thank you so much for the time again, Vito. It was great hearing you speak again, and we're so happy to have the chance to connect with you again after a macro class. <laughs> um, it was great getting to hear more about your career trajectory, and we really appreciate all your thoughtful insights and advice. Um, with that being said, we want to gear up now for our final round. Um, and so we'd just like to introduce our final round judges and participants. We have four judges joining us today for the final round. And of course, we have Vito Menza first with no further introduction needed, joining as a judge. 
We also have Linda Lassiter from Las Edge Global Investors, who is a portfolio manager on the international micro or small cap and global research teams. And prior to joining the team, Linda earned an MBA from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth and a Bachelor of Business Administration in Management Information Systems from the University of Texas. We also have Ethan Portnoy, a VP in Bain Capital's private equity group. Um, Ethan received an MBA from Harvard Business School and graduated from Dartmouth majoring in economics with a minor in Spanish. Ethan was also a previous president of DIP and now serves on our alumni board. And lastly, we have Teddy Carter, a VP at CC Capital, who worked on numerous private and SPAC transactions. Um, prior to joining CC Capital, Teddy worked on the private equity investment team at Audax. And Teddy graduated from Dartmouth with a major in economics, and he was also a previous DIP president and now serves on our alumni board. So thank you to all of our judges for your time and feedback today in judging. Yeah, and we have four teams today competing in the finals. Our first team presenting will be presenting Silicon Motion Technology, or SIMO, and it's made of Ayo, a junior at Princeton, Trisha, also a junior at Princeton, Matthew, a um, freshman at Princeton, and Rosenzo, a freshman at Princeton. Our next team that will be presenting will be pitching Canada Goose. It's made of Ryan, a senior at Princeton, Justin, also a senior at Princeton, John, a sophomore at Princeton, and Helen, a freshman at Princeton. Our third team will be pitching Board Gaming, or BYD. It will be made of Azim, a junior at UPenn, Harjeet, a junior at UPenn, Nardim, and a sophomore at Cornell. Our last team presenting will be presenting Cohort, and will be made off sophomores from Dartmouth and DIP, Geoff, Jason, Mahir, and Aryan. We're very excited to see all the pitches that will be in the finals, and thank you all for your tremendous work from all the way from preliminary rounds to semifinals to the finals now. We're excited to see all your pitches and hear what you have to say. Lastly, we'd like to introduce our freshman showcase participants and judges. We recognize that most stock pitch competitions around the country only run one general final round. However, investing and finance are often not taught in high schools. So we wanted to give freshmen the chance to showcase their incredible work from what's often just a semester's worth of finance education from their classes or club curriculums. We were so impressed by the work presented and are thrilled to be introducing these five teams who each have at least two freshmen. First, we have Expel made up of Tomas, Jay, Otakar, and Shiv from UPenn. Second, we have Ram, Ervind, Rohan, and Michael from Dartmouth and the University of Wisconsin-Madison pitching Newbank. Third, we have a team from UT Austin made up of Jackson, Priyanka, Carter, and Catherine presenting Jack in the Box. Fourth, we have a team pitching First Solar made up of Jason, Claire, Raylin, and Lily from UC Berkeley. And our last team is pitching RxO made up of Daniel, Pinnock, Pranav, and David from Cornell. We'd also like to introduce the judges for this round, who are Kevin Frankfurt from Fidelity Investments. He's currently an equity research analyst at Fidelity and was a former DIP investment committee member who graduated from Dartmouth in 2015. Henry Worum from Palm Drive Capital is currently a principal at their New York-based venture capital fund. He previously interned at, at Iconic Capital and graduated from Dartmouth in 2017. And finally, we have Alex Schaefer from Morgan Stanley Investment Management, who is a VP and portfolio analyst in their broad markets fixed income division. And he previously worked at Eaton Vans before its acquisition by Morgan Stanley. Now we'd like to take a short break before beginning our final rounds at 2 p.m. Eastern. Please note that the upperclassmen final round will be happening in this webinar and our freshman showcase will be in a separate webinar, which we will send a link in the webinar chat. Thank you again for coming today, and we hope that you learned a lot from Vito's keynote address. Okay. Can you guys see the screen share? Okay, great. So today we'll be pitching Silicon Motion Long with a price target of $95 and an investment horizon of one to two years. Silicon Motion is a semiconductor company that produces NAND flash controllers. Their current setup is that over the past year, it's experienced several temporary headwinds that have left the stock at two thirds of its 52 week high and a trough multiple. So right now the street is currently extrapolating forwards those negative headlines about semiconductors and memory demand um, while completely writing off the possibility that Simon's acquisition by Max Linear will be approved. 
These headwinds can be boiled down to three major points. First, the worsening U.S.-China relationship has led to a ban of some semiconductor sales to Chinese entities. However, the generation of memory that Simo works with won't be as affected, while direct competitors also have more exposure to China. Second, fears of weakening end market demand have depressed memory stocks for the last three quarters. However, we're anticipating a demand recovery by the end of 23, beginning of 24, which means that now is the time to enter, and the expectation currently embedded in the stock price already anticipates lower demand. Finally, street analysts have completely dismissed the possibility that the Chinese governing body will approve Max Linear's proposed acquisition of SIMO, despite strong precedent. So once you strip away the inflated negativity that's currently depressing the stock, you're left with a business that's experiencing a shift in competitive dynamics that leaves, its, that leaves it best positioned to take share, has made really smart investments to develop leading tech that will capture design wins in the next two to three years, and is currently at a trough multiple in the memory cycle. So throughout this pitch, we'll first debunk investors' misconceptions that third-party controllers, makers like Simo, will be replaced by other parts of the supply chain turning in-house. Second, we'll explain how Simo will gain share through design wins in QLC NAND and uh, PCIe Gen 5 controllers. Finally, we'll dive into an analysis of the memory cycle and why now is the right time to buy before the cycle flips. Those three points make up our base case, then we'll account for the bull case, which is the acquisition passing. We'll expand further, but to summarize, if the acquisition goes through, the stock will return 75% with an 81% IRR for best case approval timeline and a 35% with a more conservative one. Let's break down the business overview by operating segments. Firstly, SSD controllers. SSDs are memory microchips that you would find in your PC or in a high-end smartphone like an iPhone. SSD controllers are secularly replacing slower HDD controllers, which is beneficial for Simo because it will be the first to produce the next-gen PCIe 5 chip. Secondly, on EMMC slash UFS controllers. UFS controllers, which can be found in mid-market smartphones and computers, are replacing slower EMMC chips. Simo is a large player in both UFS and EMMC as it supplies UFS chips to Micron and it is taking unclaimed market share in EMMC. Lastly, on ES SSD solutions, through SSD solutions, Simo supplies enterprise quantities of SSD controllers to Chinese giants, Baidu and Alibaba. And these partnerships are deepening, providing Simo with large opportunities for growth into the future. Okay, to give a brief overview of the competitive landscape, uh, Simo primarily faces competition from two other controller vendors, Fizen and Marvell, and to a lesser extent from NAND flash makers such as Samsung, SK Hynix, and Micron, who have historically produced some of their own controllers in-house. Now, we're seeing favorable competitive dynamics in all three segments. First, in SSD controllers, we note that Simo has been able to gain market share over Fizen because Fizen directly competes with its customers in the SSD space, which creates a conflict of interest. As a result, Simo has been able to win over crucial customers such as Kyoxia and Kingston, the largest SSD supplier. Also, Marvell has been making a deliberate transition out of the client SSD space since 2018, and these two dynamics leave Simo as the current market leader with at least one third market share in client SSD. Second, Simo has made its greatest gains in its EMMC and UFS controller segment, as both Samsung and SK Hynix prematurely exited the EMMC controller market in 2021, leaving Simo as the only meaningful provider. And these market share gains mean that Simo will greatly benefit from increasing demand for both EMMC and UFS controllers, and they're also expanding into high growth automotive end markets. Finally, for SSD solutions, Simo has been consistently growing its business with Chinese hyperscalers such as Alibaba and Baidu, and is shifting to a consignment structure, which results in higher gross margins and improved demand visibility. So I will also break down the demand landscape by operating segments. Firstly, SSD controllers. Simo is the market leader in SSD controllers, and it will be able to reach 40 to 50% market share given its additional secured foundry capacity through TSMC. Intel purchases of Simo's SSD controllers have been equal to or greater than 10% of Simo's revenue for four out of the past five years, which provides consistent demand in the segment. Forward-looking demand for SSD controllers is positive, especially because demand for high-end PC and smartphone like Apple or a high-end Samsung remains strong. Secondly, on EMMC slash UFS controllers, UFS's replacement of EMMC led competitors to leave the EMMC space, allowing Simo to claim market share in a market that has a 3% future CAGR. The street worries about Micron's in-housing of some UFS chips, but industry experts confirm that Micron's UFS business would completely fail without Simo's chips. And investors are concerned because demand for low to mid-end smartphone and PC is currently low, but it is likely to rebound in the second half of 2023. 
I'll conclude with SSD solutions. Demand for SSD solutions remains strong, with many data sellers like Hewlett Packard and Equinix increasing CapEx into 2023. And key customers like Alibaba and Baidu rely on Simo because they have very little capacity to produce SSDs themselves. And at the same time, Alibaba, uh, Simo is less than 1% of Alibaba's infrastructure spend. And so this combination gives Simo a lot of pricing power in the partnership. So now that we've covered what the company does and some of the competitive and market dynamics, we'll move on to our first thesis point, which is that investors underestimate Simo's moat as a third-party controller vendor, and that Simo will continue to gain market share as competitors are forced to exit. So starting on the top left, the first thing to understand is that developing SSD controllers is extremely complicated and R&D intensive. Over the past two decades, the market has shrunk to just three players, Simo, Fizen, and Marvell, because other companies who are unable to consistently develop the best products have been forced out. The timeline in the top right provides a list of companies who exited or were acquired after going bankrupt, with Intel, with Intel being the most recent player to leave the space. Within the three remaining players, we believe that Simo is in the best position to gain market share due to Marvell deliberately exiting the client SSD space and Fizen being viewed as a competitor by its customers. Finally, investors have overestimated the threat of NAND makers developing controllers in-house rather than outsourcing to third-party vendors such as Simo. This has been a common concern since Simbo's inception, but it has never played out. In the bottom left, you can see a timeline of failed in-housing attempts from both Micron and SK Hynix, two of Simo's biggest customers. In addition to historical analysis, there are two main reasons why NAND makers are unable to consistently develop controllers in-house. The first is a substantial knowledge and expertise mode of existing players. And the second is that third-party vendors are able to invest much more into R&D because they can distribute these costs across dozens of customers whereas NAND makers can only use their controllers internally. Next, we'll talk about how Silicon Motion has positioned itself really well for design wins with superior product development and the structural shifts that favor this new technology. So I'll preface by emphasizing the importance of design wins, which essentially means that a NAND flash manufacturer will decide to use a specific controller, um, for example, Simos or Marvells or Fisons, and then designs it into their product. That makes it extremely sticky because then it's really hard to switch without super high like costs. So these are one with either the best technology or being the first to market. Um, we've seen over the past two to three years that Simo has been heavily investing in R&D for QLC NAND and the PCIe Gen 5 controller to position itself for design wins. So more recently, it's been like investing around five to 10% more of revenue versus competitors. So that first technology, QLC NAND, is basically a type of technology that is more dense and cost effective than the current standard, um, which is called TLC NAND. So Simo released the first QLC controller in 2018 and has since achieved design wins with Micron and Intel, the two players that lead the space. Furthermore, that QLC market is expanding really rapidly with two major tailwinds. First, it brings down the cost of SSDs, so that means that it will help to replace HDDs in future refresh cycles. And second, controllers become even more important within this because with QLC, it improves the amount of like error concentration there is. So the second product we looked at, the PCIe Gen 5 controller, is targeted towards higher margin enterprise customers, and our channel checks have indicated that they will be the first to scale, which means that they can win upwards of 50% share. In conclusion, Simo has made the right investments to win designs um, and gain share in these fast-growing products, but investors are failing to recognize this because in previous years, Simo has uh, historically lagged its competitors, but now they're going to be able to produce higher quality products faster than their competitors. In addition to improving competitive dynamics and positioning, Silicon Motion is at a really attractive entry point in the memory cycle. So in the left-hand graph, we can see the historical price to earnings multiple has historically been bounded by around like 9x and 18x. Of course, in the last few months, we've seen the multiple dip below this floor as the entire market has experienced significant multiple compression and Silicon Motion was having like a difficult macro setup. So now we're around 10x, which is close to all-time lows. This price to earnings cycle, like how do we predict that? It's very closely tied to supply and demand and anticipates turns in the cycle. So then the question is when will stock bottom and how early should we buy? On the right-hand side, you can see our analysis of the memory cycle through Micron and Silicon Motion. The last 12 months revenues versus stock price indicate that the stock price typically tends to rebound around three to four quarters before the cycle actually flips. So anticipating that demand rebound by the end of 23, beginning of 24, now is the right time to enter. And we've also got downside protection with the trough multiple, which makes this investment a really safe bet. 
So the street essentially underwrites a 0% chance of acquisition approval, but the actual likelihood is much higher. I'll break this down by the two things that need to happen for the deal to be approved. The first is SAMR approval. The largest risk to SAMR approval is China-US tensions, especially considering the US's October semiconductor sanctions against China. However, SAMR approved the NVIDIA Mellanox deal, even despite tensions due to Trump sanctions. So rejection would be inconsistent with typical SAMR policy, as the vertical nature of the acquisition limits actual antitrust risk. SAMR rejection would be widely seen as a foreign policy move, which would be highly, highly controversial. The second thing that needs to happen is repeat U.S. approval if SAMR approves later than June 27th, 2023. But repeat U.S. approval is not actually an issue because the two agencies that determine HSR approval, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, will not change leadership until at least 2025. So in summary, we think that the overall likelihood of deal approval is 20 to 25 percent because similar cases in the past have been approved roughly one third of the time. And we add a significant discount to that because of the U.S.'s recent strong semiconductor sanctions on China. Now, moving on to valuation, we valued Silicon Motion using a price to earnings multiple. Based on our analysis of the cycle, we very conservatively projected out a bit of multiple expansion from the current 10x to 12x in 2024. So given the usual trough and peak multiple bounds for Silicon Motion, um, we believe that 12x is a pretty conservative estimate. And we've already taken into account the fact that this general market multiple decline we've seen in the past few months may be sustained for the next few years. Then on the EPS side, a few assumptions drive the numbers. So we modeled out revenue by overlaying a cycle on end market CAGRs and then projected out gross margin using assumptions about a richer product mix. Then we assume that some economies of scale will kick in as their new technology launches widely, which will drive slight increases in operational efficiency. So as a result, we come to a base case price target of $95 by the end of 2024. And that gives us an IRR of $22 or 22%. Okay, so we benchmarked Simo against some of their publicly traded suppliers, customers, and closest competitors, which are the NAND flash manufacturers. And we see that even within the current industry downturn, Simo is still trading at a discount relative to its peers on a PE basis, currently at a roughly 10x multiple. And this is despite a strong margin profile and projected growth. Now, to address some of the risks involved as well as their mitigants, the first risk is that SAMR blocks the max linear acquisition. And although we do believe the chances of acquisition being improved are higher than what is currently underwritten, we're not relying on this, and we do not factor the acquisition into our base case. In the event that it is blocked, Simo will receive a $160 million breakup fee, and given their history of dividends and share buybacks, we expect the excess cash to be returned to shareholders. The second risk is that slowing demand in Simo's end markets persists longer than expected. In this case, we note that Simo is already trading at a trough multiple, which provides downside protection, and market share gains will partially offset any decreases in demand. The third risk is that Simo will be forced out of the controller market by competing technology, and we believe this is extremely unlikely given Simo's long history of successful execution and growth and their current lead in PCI Gen 5 and TLC tech. Also, controller production always requires joint development with manufacturers, and Simo's five biggest customers have made up over 50% of their demand every year since 2011. These well-established relationships combined with industry-leading tech will continue to deter new players. We will wrap up with two additional considerations. The first is that strong financials, a strong financials and shareholder value proposition, Simo has consistently had strong free cash flow and a strong balance sheet, which limits downside. If the max linear deal were not to go through, Simo would likely allocate the $160 million breakup fee, or at least a significant portion of it, to dividends or share buybacks because it is shareholder value focused. The second additional consideration is fast growing end markets. Data centers are seeing strong demand into 2023 and beyond, which will allow Simo to grow its SSD solutions business. And as electric vehicle penetration increases and internal combustion engine cars have more complex safety and infotainment systems, Simo's AutoTAM will grow from 32 million in 2022 to 122 million in 2027. Simo is very well positioned in the auto market as automakers and their suppliers like to rely on large incumbents like Simo in the space due to reliability and solvency. So to summarize, we believe that Simo is a fundamentally improving company with near-term catalysts that has been penalized for temporary and non-fundamental dynamics. So thank you for listening and we are more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, we'll open it up to a 10 minute Q&A. Um, can I ask a question on, so I, I guess the thesis is um, dependent on the R&D, the recent R&D investments being productive and then winning design wins. Can you talk a little bit about 
the channel checks that you did just to uh, that, um, uh, I guess, increase your conviction that they would be winning design wins? Yeah, sounds good. So the first thing is that they're generally just becoming stronger in the space. So we've seen with like the PCIe generation three, they kind of rolled that out a little late and kind of had like around like 20 to 30% adoption. And that was much lower. But then with the generation four, they've already started creating like partnerships with uh, partnerships with these different firms and they're projecting around like 50% for this. And so the way that we looked at like figuring out what like how the technology was doing was we looked through like transcripts from Tegas and AlphaSense and basically um, some of the experts kind of in this area have talked about like which uh, which companies are kind of best positioned to do well with these different technologies because it's kind of like well known within that space like which of the products are kind of going to be like rolling out first and which ones have like already uh, started like working on partnerships with the manufacturers. And um, in Mar did you say Marvell was their um, main competitor in the space? Yes. And it, did you do any work on how what how their technology is tracking? Yeah, so I think with uh, for like PCIe generation four and generation five, it seems like they're at least like a few quarters behind Simo. Um, we haven't been able to find like an exact timeline, but based on what we've seen, like more companies have been like working on their partnerships with Silicon Motion. Yeah, and just to add on to that, another source we've been looking at that really improves our conviction is um, technology conferences and summits. And so there are a few of these at the end of 2022, and we saw that Silicon Motion was essentially displaying successful PCI Gen 5 controllers, and uh, they were pretty far ahead of Marvell in their competition. Okay, thank you. How, how did you guys come to understand they're ahead of Marvell in their competition? I mean, that's pretty complex, pretty complex stuff. Did you consult an expert or just curious? Because I, I wouldn't really know. Yeah, so I guess I can start out and then maybe Trisha can add on. But um, at least for the conferences, that's something I looked at. And so all of the third party controller vendors are very keen to display like the best products they have at all these conferences because it's a good way to, uh, you know, attract new customers. And so Simo, like I said, they were they showed like a successful, very quick uh, Gen 5 controller and um, Marvell did not have a product, at least at the conferences we looked at at sort of Q3, Q4 2022. So you actually, you actually went through the product specs that was that were presented at the conference yourself uh, uh yeah very impressive uh, at least like a general overview to the extent that you know we can we can understand it no that's great it means that you, you, you obviously have a knack for being a tech analyst huh? it's great hey i have a i have another question and this is just um you know, let's pretend that you're you were pitching this to me in, in my fund and so all of this uh, i guess all of the semiconductor space is down a lot, and um, and I, I don't know semiconductors as well, but I know I just uh, I just comp this to like a semiconductor uh, index and to the Nasdaq, and they look like um, it's trading in line. And this one sounds like it has a little bit of hair on it with the acquisition, um, with all those things. So why is this one um, better? than another semiconductor company, uh, Syllergy or some of the uh, analog chip companies or, or the equipment makers, why is this one the one when everything is down like 50%? Yeah, I can start with this. Um, I think the reason why we think that Simo is a really interesting idea is because it has been like it has taken a really hard beating with like all of the what you called like hair around the stock. Basically, there's just been a lot of like negative news. But we think that based off of like reading through a bunch of sell side reports and kind of like reading through all of their earnings call transcripts, there's just been a disproportionate amount of focus on that and all of these other like factors that are coming into account where like the they're becoming better positioned in their space and they've still managed to maintain like their position as like 
one of the top third party like controller makers, like all of this stuff has been kind of overlooked. Um, and it's kind of showing that the business is just improving fundamentally. But we think that basically because all of the news right now is kind of centered around these things that are like pretty transient and also have now become really baked into the stock and are shown in the stock price that like there's a lot of opportunity that has been kind of hidden underneath all of this. Okay. Is I, there I any question just around um go ahead Ethan. No go ahead. Go ahead. No go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. I, I had a question just around some of the customer dynamics and just how do you think about just their position in the value chain relative to a relatively concentrated customer base that are large and maybe have pricing power i know you spoke a little bit about kind of the defensibility around insourcing risk but um just kind of had that question of more around there's kind of the question of insourcing risk there's a question of if it's a blended insource outsource mix, mix there's going to be like a first derivative impact where you get probably the outsource capacity gets hit first before in-source capacity when demand is soft. And then I think there's also just a pricing question at which all this happens. Just kind of curious how you guys think about their position vis-a-vis -vis their customers. Actually, so I, if it's okay, Trisha, I can take the first part of this. Um, so you mentioned like that outsource demand to simul, like, like let's take the Micron example, for example. Um, so Micron has attempted to in-house some of its chips, particularly its lower end chips. And the dyna demand dynamics actually play out in the opposite way that you discussed, because what's actually hit hardest is what Micron in-houses, because what it needs from Simo, no matter what, even in like the worst case scenario, is the higher quality chips, because what Micron has been in-housing are like the chips where you need less technological knowledge for, because they're less advanced in that area. And what has been succeeding the most right now with you know, slow demand in PC and smartphone and worries of a possible recession has been high end PC and smartphone, which is what like Simo is supplying higher end stuff to Micron. So if anything, Micron stuff would be um, harder hit. So yeah, Trish, if you want to follow up with that. Yeah, I think you covered most of it. Just to add on, they've been kind of diversifying their customer base a lot. Um, and I think that it's actually one of the interesting dynamics is because I think maybe Matthew mentioned as like some of their competitors have had to leave the space. There's been this dynamic where like Simo is like one of the only or one of, of only a handful of like manufacturers for the type of chip that they need to make. So that actually gives them a significant amount of leverage over their customers. Do you all think about any particular catalysts in driving the sort of multiple appreciation you're modeling here? Should we think about that being this deal gets approved or not? Is there other sort of earnings print that's going to be important? Just how should we think about sort of what the timing is and if there shouldn't be any particular catalyst in, in driving that, that appreciation? Yeah, I can take this one. So right now, we're not expecting that the acquisition goes through since we think the like the probability of that is relatively low, although we think it's higher than the street expects for the reasons that we outlined. So what we're expecting for like multiple expansion is like how it happened in like previous years is basically like around three to four quarters before like demand actually flips before the cycle flips. Um, analysts will start to become like a little more bullish on the stock and like the general semiconductor space and like memory demand will start to like look like it might recover over the next like year, year and a half. Um, and that's kind of like just improving macro sentiment has and like improving demand dynamics have generally been like the catalyst for moving the multiple back up. Got it. So it's it's the sort of semiconductor cycle flipping and you getting broader industry appreciation. Yeah, exactly. I think we have time for one more question. I, I have one. Have, have you done a lot of work on um you know, one of the challenges with this semi-cycle is some chips are still inventory issues, uh, being companies not being able to get them and others, there's actually inventory building going on um, and are gonna have problems with that. Have you done any work either on where they're, where there's oversupplied, where they're undersupplied of their chips? And the other part of the question is just pricing in general. I'm just curious, what percentage of their products, you know, would you say have, very few alternatives in pricing power and which percentage of the products, you know, with semiconductors, you always have to watch pricing tends to go down over time, not up. I know with the pandemic, it went up, but is that sustainable?
Yeah, so when we looked at, so we looked at in the model, we looked at inventory cycles for Silicon Motion, all of its kind of biggest competitors, and then other um, like suppliers and customers in the space. And basically what we determined is that even though inventory is like currently uh, at like a pretty high level, they announced like in their earnings call transcripts that they would be going through like churning through all of that at, and with with their customers and with like different distributors in Simo over the next few quarters. So right now we're kind of seeing like the main like glut of having a ton of inventory um, and that's going to kind of come down over like the next few quarters. And this is kind of just like how the inventory cycle tends to work. And we were looking at some like historicals. And even though now we're at kind of an all time high, like it is, uh, it kind of just like mirrors what has happened in the past. So we expect something similar to happen moving forwards. Um, and sorry, could you repeat the second part of that question? But just where, how much, like what percentage of their products do you think they really have pricing power? And what percentage are just subject to normal semiconductor pricing, which really tends to go down over time? We done an yeah. analysis, you know, percentage of revenues. How much do you really feel they have? I think Linda basically was getting at it. How much is something special um, that they're going to be able to demand pricing power, no matter what the inventory situation, and how much is just super competitive? Yeah, um, I can take this unless someone else wants to. So I think generally for a lot of the products in the in the space, how it works is like they're pretty indexed to like general changes in the semiconductor like industry and like as kind of supply and demand comes up and down price moves with it but there are a few factors that kind of help Simo and like maintaining a little bit of pricing power so for example with like the whole EMMC space that we were talking about um, that whole space is basically here I can go back to the slide but that whole space there's just no other competitors in the space anymore so like with around like 15 to 20 percent of their revenues for example they're like the sole supplier of course they're not going to be like unfair in the way that they price but they have a little more leverage there um, and then with for example like ssd controllers which are a huge proportion of the revenue um, basically once like it, it's really difficult for like people in for the NAND flash manufacturers to like not have the best technology and like take kind of like a better priced uh, controller for like worse technology just because then like the end product that you're making is just subpar and like that is kind of a difficult dynamic to have which is why a lot of times in the space just like the best product or the one that comes out like fastest to market ends up winning designs and then you can't really end up switching because if you've already designed this product into your own product then like and like pricing comes out to like higher than expected because of the way the supply and demand moves, then you're going to have like a huge upfront cost to like change that. So those are a few factors that make like Simo's pricing a little more defensible. But so give me I, a percent. So give me a percentage you think pricing is 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 largely insulated. Okay. Well, I mean if we were to break it down, well, like SSD solutions is a bit of a different dynamic. So I wouldn't include that in it, but then for like EMMC, it's like pretty much all of it. So let's give that around like 20%. Um, UFS controllers are, I don't think have like the same type of pricing dynamic just because they're not the only player in the space. Um, and then with SSD controllers, if we're thinking about like their newer products versus the older product mix. So like the PCIe, um, controllers make up around like 30% of total revenues because they're around half of like the SSD controllers. So I think those ones are also more insulated just because the technology there is a little more advanced whereas the older technology that they have, which is called like SATA technology, um, there are a lot more competitors in that space. So around like 40 to 50% seems to be a little more like defensible. Okay. Great, thank you for that pitch and the Q and A. Um, we really appreciate the time you spent on this presentation. Uh, with that, we'd like to welcome the next team who is pitching Canada Goose. So I will change over the presenters and- Job guys. Thank you. Thank you.
You can start whenever you're ready. Perfect. Is everyone good? My screen, they can see as well. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan. And today, along with Justin, Helen, and John, we will be pitching a long on Canada Goose. Our price target for 15 months out is 42 Canadian dollars a share, corresponding to a 38% IRR. For note, all dollar signs in this stack are Canadian dollars, and the current exchange rate is shown here. Canada Goose is a leading manufacturer of luxury outerwear, most famously known for their parkas. This apparel is priced in the 1.5K range and is a combination of technical wear and luxury fashion. Going a little bit into the history of Goose, Goose began as a wholesaler based in Toronto, Canada, and has shifted to retail since then, first with expansion into e-commerce in 2014, then with retail stores in 2017. Goose has approximately 45 stores globally, growing at 30% per year pre-COVID. It has since decelerated to the low mid-teens, and while sales per store are currently below pre-COVID levels, they should rebound as China opens back up. Following backlash regarding the return policy in China, further COVID lockdowns, and a very rare miss in the latest quarter, sentiment around Goose has hit an all-time low. Goose has historically traded at a premium to peers due to a superior growth story, but the spread is effectively closed as street EPS numbers have been cut about 30% and short interest has increased from about 5% afloat to about 20% today. Furthermore, there are multiple sell ratings on the stock with investors concerned about further China uncertainty and deteriorating brand equity. We think that this material reset and the street's mismodeling of the next few years provide an attractive opportunity to enter as the muddled story cleans up significantly over the next year and a half. There are three main points to the thesis. First, brand concerns are overblown. Our analysis of Chinese social media and anecdotal evidence suggests that the brand is on fire in China. Additionally, our alternative data checks indicate that the brand value remains intact and has even enabled Goose to take significant pricing from the pandemic. Secondly, COVID led to a deceleration in revenue growth and the street has improperly extrapolated these impacts forward. We believe that COVID impacts to store productivity have mass acceleration in domestic US and Canada growth. A significant increase in retail store footprint and return of productivity will, will enable a powerful EPS growth algorithm through volume recovery and a favorable mix shift towards um, direct to consumer. Third, we can use Montclair as a case study to see that Goose is a long growth runway and mix shift story ahead. They are running a similar playbook by making investments in Asia and high growth emerging segments like knitwear and footwear. This is depressed margins in the short term, but should enable inflection upwards as they are currently under earning. Our work leads us to believe Goose will be consensus 2025 EPS by around 33%. Given low sentiment and a trough relative multiple, we see an attractive risk reward and underwrite a potential 38% IRR. The street views Goose as one, a single product luxury brand with significant fad risk, and two, hitting penetration in North America. We disagree with both points. We believe that saturation risks are overblown, especially as international tourism is underestimated um, in North American revenues. International tourism is significantly higher, is a significantly higher contributor to historical North Am revenues than most invest investors think, about 50% which means actual domestic penetration is a lot lower. Additionally, street conceptions that Goose is a one item brand is incorrect. 20 to 30% of customers buy more than two items per year and 30 to 40% of customers buy every year showing strong brand loyalty. Overall, we analyze state by state demographic data to determine the number of households that live above the 37th parallel and make greater than $200,000 a year. We believe TAM penetration is only about 8% in US and 25% in Canada. Independent of North AM revenue, there's a long growth runway in Asia. Go Goose only finds 30% of its revenue from Asia, lower than most other luxury companies like Montclair. Overall, in each key luxury market, Canada Goose is still in its early stages of penetration and shows room for growth.
The first luxury outerwear segment includes both Canada Goose and Montclair, who are both well positioned to take advantage of the luxury parka and puffer jacket secular trend that emerged in the 2010s. There are other competitors in the space, but Canada Goose and Montclair are clear leaders. Montclair sells at a higher price point and is viewed as more fashionable, while Goose sells at a slight discount and is a more utilitarian alternative. The luxury puck, puffer and parka trend has taken considerable market share from the traditional luxury brands who have historically specialized in more formal outerwear, such as trench and pea coats. These brands target an increasingly older audience and have struggled to gain traction with the younger demographic. Only recently have these brands started to shift towards more trendy outerwear. While these fashion houses all have significant, uh, significantly more diversified product lines, they have struggled to adapt that have impaired their brand equity through deep discounting and other poor brand decisions. Finally, there is a category of ultra-functional outerwear geared primarily towards a demogra demographic of technical skiers and hikers. The functional outerwear segment lacks luxury branding of the other two segments and has lower ASPs as a result. Technical jackets are also viewed as increment incremental items typically purchased after their luxury peers. Contrary to investor fears, we believe that brand equity for Goose is stronger than ever and have done significant work in channel checks to verify this. We scraped pricing information and reviews of all Goose, Burberry, and Montclair products in all geographies across all major wholesalers that Goose sells through, finding no evidence of discounting to clear inventory during the pandemic and average reviews that are on par with other top tier luxury brands like Montclair. Furthermore, our scrape to product resales on the real real show that Goose's average resale value as a percentage of original price is best in class. Lastly, we saw high levels of repeat buying among Goose customers. In terms of concerns regarding backlash in China over the previously mentioned return policy issues, our own analysis of Chinese social media engagement and anecdotal evidence that we've collected from people inside the country indicate that the brand is on fire in China and that store productivity is coming back online as lines are constantly out the door. Overall, we found significant evidence of brand value and loyalty. This is supported by an additional scrape of Canada Goose prices, where we found that they have taken 20% like-for-like -like pricing growth through the pandemic, which is higher than the low teens that the street has underwritten. Prior to COVID, Canada Goose was growing greater than 30% top line per year, with the growth algorithm being driven by 10 to 12 new store openings, as well as 6% pricing growth per year. Today, we think Goose is a better business than prior to the pandemic. Pricing is 20% higher, and they've shifted their unit sales mix to 50% through retail channels from 35% prior to the pandemic. Recall that retail channels have three times the EBIT dollars per jacket as a result of double the ASP when they don't have to give their wholesalers a cut of the, uh, of the um, jacket sale. However, COVID disrupted this algorithm and resulted in sales productivity declining rapidly, particularly in China. Today, sales per foot are still 40% below pre-COVID levels. Of lockdowns have halted growth in China entirely. Markets doubt the China lockdown story because Canada Goose and Montclair telegraphed different things during the last quarterly earnings call, with Montclair calling out significant strength in China, even as Goose saw declining volumes, with Goose attributing it as a result of lockdowns and markets not believing that because of the results of peers. However, our analysis of the geographic distribution of Montclair and Canada Goose stores reveals that Canada Goose stores genuinely are acutely concentrated in areas that got hit harder by lockdowns than Montclair's much more distributed store presence in the area. As a result, as China reopens up, we expect the retail store revenue growth to converge with the square foot CAGR that, that Canada Goose has opened the retail storefront uh, over the past couple of years. We also believe Canada Goose can follow Montclair's growth algorithm from 2014 to 2019 to significantly expand globally. Both Montclair and Burberry have more than 200 global stores, while Goose only has roughly 45. Goose has not yet fully expanded beyond Canada, with significant room to grow left in Asia. Additionally, Goose has not yet built out their knitwear or footwear segments, which both have poten the potential to significantly diversify Goose's revenue. Compared to Montclair, Goose is also under earning as investments in Asia have not yet paid off and Goose has yet to obtain the same operating leverage. However, given the similarity of the cost structure between the two brands, Goose's long-term EBIT margin of 30% seems achievable. Overall, Goose should be able to expand their margins by roughly 1,000 pips as their operating leverage on China Investments and Top Wang Kager both expand. This will result in around 30% compound EPS growth over our projection period.
We believe that back of the envelope valuation highlights the asymmetry in this investment today. We would note the following. First, direct-to-consumer mix has shifted to 50% of units today, up from 35% prior to the pandemic, which is three times the EBIT dollars per jacket and two times the revenue per jacket. Additionally, like-for-like -like pricing is 20 to 25% higher, and Goose will continue to take price at 6% per year for the rest of the projection period. Goose's store presence has quadrupled since prior to the pandemic and will double again to over 90 stores by the end of the projection period. And volumes per store, however, have fallen off a cliff because of lockdowns. But if we step back and believe that the overall company can do 30% more volume in 2027 than pre-pandemic levels, despite having nine times more stores, we end up with a 27% higher forecast than 2027 consensus revenue. This implies sales productivity measured by square sales per foot in line with pre-pandemic levels by the end of the projection period. Given the built-in operating leverage of this business and the pricing flow through to margins, we expect margins to rebound to their mid-20s in line to, with their pre-pandemic margins and reasonable given that they do 30% incremental margins and have a similar cost structure to Montclair, which is greater than 30% mar EBIT margins. Given these assumptions in the center, the sensitivity tables show that there's a heavy discount to intrinsic value today, even with less optimistic assumptions than what we might necessarily underwrite in the base case. More specifically on our underwriting in the base case um, and kind of moving away from the back of the envelope math, we expect to meaningfully outperform equity indices with a 38% IRR in the next 15 months. We underrate China reopening in first half fiscal 24. And because Goose reports on a March fiscal year end, this corresponds to China reopening uh, during the summer of this calendar year, which they've already started to do. And we're starting to see um, things kind of open up. We think international tourism likely in, is underwritten in our base case to open near the beginning of next calendar year. So first half of uh, uh, calendar year 2024. And Goose can continue to take price at 6% per year and open stores at a clip of 10 new stores per year. We think that volume per store resets the pre-pandemic levels by the end of our production period, indicating that the new four-wall unit economics of stores that have been opened is in line with what they've already opened given the relatively small store presence today. All in, capitalizing at a 17x EPS multiple on $4 of adjusted EPS, we result in a 32% IRR on a three-year basis, but on a 15-month basis, a 38% IRR as it returns up to $42 a share as their price target. We think 17x is reasonable, given that peers like Montclair and Burberry trade at 16 to 20x, and Goose has historically had a multiple premium to these names as a result of the stronger growth algorithm and the early days of its growth runway, as opposed to Montclair, which is much more saturated. Additionally, we look at what happens if someone buys the stock from us at 17x in the out year. We think actually that that results in a pretty good return if you project three more years forward past our projection period. And we think the multiple could actually go as high as 20x EPS um, while they're still get, generating a relatively cost of equity like return. Historically, Goose has traded at a heavy premium to peers like Montclair and Burberry. However, despite its superior growth profile and potential for margin improvement, Goose now trades at a trough multiple to Montclair at an EBITDA basis and trades in line at a price to earnings basis as investors have begun to doubt the China story and brand strength. As the story cleans up though, the company has significant room to expand to historical levels. We believe the PE multiple will re-rate as fears about China subside. The return setup on Goose is highly asymmetric with about a 1.3x risk to reward at today's share price and a blended expected return of 50% over the one over the next 1.5 years. In the downside case, the China segment materially worsens with Goose having completely lost its appeal in China. Goose's core geographies have also hit penetration leading to negative volume growth and Goose becomes a high single digit grower. In this case, we think they're going to do a $1.50 of EPS given margins flat from today. However, this is a truly worst case scenario in which our theses are incorrect. In our base case, China reopens on the timeline we expect. Under this assumption, Goose has recovered back to pre-COVID levels, now with more stores and room for multiple expansion. The upside case is that Goose takes off, tracing a similar outlook to Montclair. Goose expands in all areas, including their core parka cells, as well as knitwear and footwear. One minute left. Well, we have covered both brand impairment and China risks, Canada Goose is also exposed to a recessionary macro environment. They're concerned that a recession will lessen luxury spending and lower the upside of new store openings. 
However, luxury sportswear has proved to be a durable segment during recessionary environments, and luxury goods as a whole are usually somewhat insulated. There are also a number of catalysts, including the reopening momentum coming out of China. As China continues to reopen, we expect an uplift in Asia revenues. In addition, the lifting of travel restrictions and international tourism will provide a significant uplift to Goose's North American revenue. We also expect brand heat to continue growing in Asia as the prior refund policy backlash is forgotten by consumers. In the long term, we expect Goose to regularly beat EPS numbers as both top line and margins continue to expand. Fantastic. Um, thank you for listening to our pitch on Kim the Goose, and we're happy to answer any questions now. Um, can I ask a question on, um, I've heard um, lots of people compare Goose to Montclair and say, you know, the trajectory is similar, the wholesale to retail playbook is similar. Can you talk about how they might be different and my, how um, Goose's situation might be better or worse than uh, what Montclair, I guess, uh, versus Montclair's playbook? Um, yeah, I'm happy to start here. I think um, we're definitely not underwriting in the model that um, that Goose is going to sort of reach necessarily like the same level of like Montclair by like 2027, right? We sit at like 45 stores today in retail. Montclair has 200, um, but we think that this sets like a very reasonable bar where you know we underwrite probably like around 10 stores being opened a year. Um, and that's like a very reasonable growth cadence we think over our projection period and even going forward, right? So it shows like a very long growth trajectory. But with that being said, they don't have the same like retail presence as Montclair does today. I think, um, you know, secondly, um, you know, there is some um, level of debate around, you know, how much pricing power a goose has relative to a Montclair, right? I think, you know, John does a really good job of explaining this on sort of the competitive landscape slides. You know, we're not going to kind of come out here and say that um, Canada Goose is best in class because we think like, you know, in the luxury outerwear segment, that title does belong to Montclair. But with that being said, you know, um, with our first thesis point, we did a very significant amount of work um, in terms of scraping prices, scraping reviews, seeing how um, the value of the jacket maintains after buying it in terms of resale values, and then also asking people in China to sort of do checks on how popular the jackets are. I mean, and while we understand that they're, they're not necessarily like best in class like Montclair, we think that they still have like very powerful pricing power and management has been um, has been making all the right steps in terms of sort of like maintaining the brand, if that makes sense. Sure. And and one of the things I, I used to cover Montclair many, many years ago, but one of their things was that they had a really uh, bloated and inefficient uh, wholesale system in place. Uh, before they they converted to retail. And here, it doesn't seem like that's the case. And they have a really strong e-commerce um, presence prior to having the stores. And so does that impact sort of the, the ability to open, you know, even 100 stores? Yeah, I think the um, kind of interesting D to C to retail mix that has occurred is, if you look at Canada Goose under Bain Cap ownership over the last five years, they've essentially tried to do what Montclair did, which was, to your point, very bloated wholesale distributor relationships, trim a significant portion of those. And Canada Goose did something pretty similar. Um, but that largely has somewhat played out to some extent where, you know, for example, uh, the best example of this is Canada Goose was selling through REI, um, which is like mostly technical hiking gear uh, as a wholesale channel, which doesn't really make sense when you're trying to position yourself um, a little higher up market on that luxury side. And so they've been calling about 100 wholesale doors every single year as they've opened the retail uh, you know, store presence. And so I think it's, it's to your point, Montclair, uh, you know, we're, we're further in the story of this like D to C to retail split than Montclair was in 2014. So it's not a perfect analogy. Uh, but Canada Goose still does have a relatively longer growth way where maybe the store presence doesn't get to 200, 300 stores, but could get, you know, pretty significantly more um, than where it is for, at like 50 today. We, for instance, like pulled just comparables of all the different luxury brands within both luxury outerwear, but also broadly and very significant, like almost none of them have less than uh, 200 stores, like at the revenue scale. Um, that we underwrite Canada Goose getting to. And I think that that's kind of how we think about that, where there's a long growth runway for store openings, but you know, 
to be candid with you, we don't think this is as good of a brand as Montclair, which much more fashion forward, much higher price point and uh, much more innovative. But we think if you can get kind of 70% of the way there, the stock has a pretty compelling asymmetric setup. Thank you. How do you all think about uh, Bain Capital's involvement here and their ownership and just how does that sort of factor into your thesis? Yeah, I can touch on this. I think Bain Cap really bought this business. It's, you know, obviously one of their flagship deals um, and um, have done a very significant job of, you know, pulling the wholesale doors, shifting it to D2C. I think, you know, it's it's very late in their ownership and likely is the case that this isn't something that they want to own for a very significant, you know, longer period of time. They've gotten partially out when they took, retook it public. Um, the like CEO we've heard from formers, like really hates running a public company. This is like a family owned business to some extent still. Um, and so we think there's some optionality here where Goose could be sold to a financial or strategic sponsor if the stock kind of continues to languish. Candidly, given where the stock trades, it seems unlikely to me that Bain Cap would be exiting here, given that we think kind of as the company knows as well with the share buybacks, we think there's a pretty significant discount to intrinsic value. And so there's been pretty decent capital allocation into buying back a substantial portion of the float. Um, but you know, at, at some point in the next few years, it, it's likely that there's some sort of transaction um, where Bain Cap probably doesn't want to own this kind of for the next like five to 10 years. Yeah. How, how much do they own today? You know, I think they around, they still own around half. Yeah, got it. And do you worry about that sort of potential selling pressure weighing on the price? Yeah, it's it's an interesting, I think the float dynamics in the stock are really fascinating. I mean, yeah, to some extent, this could become dead money where you just have Bain Cap selling at a certain price and just puts kind of, you know, like a, like a ceiling on where the stock could trade. Um, I think, we haven't seen Bain Cap start to sell yet. And we kind of see like in the near term, the float dynamics kind of skew the other way where the company is buying back 10% of the outstanding flow. Um, it's the stock is 20% short as a percent of flow. And so, you know, on, on the technical dynamics here, it seems like some optimism versus consensus EPS numbers and, you know, people just being a little more constructive on the name here, um, you know, would result in, in, constructive technical dynamics on the stock rather than the opposite. Have you guys thought anything about the um, how much the brand can transcend beyond Parkas? I mean, a lot of those other luxury brands, they've had success in, uh, in, in accessories and, and getting into not just outerwear. Kind of a goose, to, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it seems like it, it might have some limitation just because of how the brand is perceived, its name, goose, down, jackets. Have you thought anything about the brand equity, how that could affect it? Um, or, yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I can- You can start, Justin. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I was just going to say, um, yeah, absolutely. Park is a sort of the bread and butter, but you know, we think Danny and, and the management team at Canada Goose has been very, they've been very intelligent, very disciplined about sort of managing the brand, right? Sort of you see through COVID, they reconsolidated the, um, the inventory in Canada, um, they've sort of controlled the growth cadence of how they're opening retail stores. But, you know, at the same time, like, I think like the concern is you sort of have like this single fad, like product risk, right? Um, with that being said, um, like Ryan kind of pointed out during the presentation, they actually do have other nascent products that are growing at a faster clip than the rest of, um, like than, than the business overall, um, particularly with knitwear and footwear only being at 5% today. Um, you can draw another sort of comparison to like a Montclair where knitwear and footwear has already grown to over 20% of their business, right? And so we do see avenues for them to grow into other products and and think that they're being like really intelligent about the way they're, they're going about it. And I think we, we thought a lot about yeah, just, what you'd need for the stock to work, um, where the knitwear footwear was really the bull case on the stock, call it two or three years ago when they acquired Baffin, which is like the footwear um, that they now sell. And I think at the current price, we kind of think of it as a call option on the business, where if they have successful traction on knitwear and footwear, which are growing, you know, north of 50% year over year, um, you're going to get some mixed shifts, like a higher growth rate as that becomes a larger percentage mix of revenue, but, you know, isn't necessarily what I think you need for the stock to trade significantly higher. 
um, and is, is more of what we think about in the upside case. And how do you think about channel conflict? Yeah, I was gonna... Sorry, go, some, somebody else jump in front of me. Go ahead, please. Oh, sorry, Vita, Vita I, was, I was just going to chime in with a, a related question, but. I was just going to ask about channel conflict, but you, you go first, Ethan, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I, I am full disclosure. I'm not, I'm not intimately involved with the company at Bain, though obviously familiar with, with the story. So this is, uh, this is my perspective as a judge and, and nothing else is the disclaimer. <laughs> so um, I, I, am, I am curious, piggybacking on, Picky backing on what Vito was picking up on. I'm just curious, like how you guys think about so much of this pitch is comparisons to Montclair. I guess the two part question. One is how you think about kind of the rise of Me Too brands or just kind of other aspirational luxury like the Moose and Macage that that you had highlighted. And I think two, just curious how you guys thought about the true comparability with Montclair, which I know other judges have picked up on. But I think also just what it what it comes down to is just why do you think customers buy Canada Goose, is it because of the brand like a, like a Montclair or is it because of performance? And if it's the latter, how you think about their right to win in other apparel categories beyond the parka where just functional performance really matters, but, but may not have the same resonance when it comes to kind of knitwear or shoes or things like that. Yeah, I, I think kind of just two pieces on this. Mm -hmm. The first is what is Canada Goose's brand? And it's like kind of as we've hit on, it's somewhere in between the, you know, Arcterixes and the Montclairs and kind of which way does it skew? And I think what we've seen is that Canada Goose has, you know, maybe started kind of in the middle of those two, but has started blending up market as they've taken price and they've kind of rolled out, you know, what they'll do is the next line of, of jackets, they'll mostly roll out the higher ASP ones and start to trim the number of SKUs on the lower side. And really what it is, I think, is the Canada Goose jacket, the parka at its core is a pretty iconic jacket. Everyone kind of recognizes it. It's seen in like, you know, New York City streets where candidly it's like not that needed for the performance side. And so like, I think the way we think about it is like, you know, this is a brand that when it started out in Canada, it was a mix of genuine, there was a lot of performance involved, but especially as they've moved into newer markets. In the United States, you can kind of see, um, you know, it's a lot more luxury. And then kind of in China, and it's like totally seen uh, as a, a kind of a status symbol versus um, the jackets. I mean, it's just like candidly not that cold in like the majority of China, but it's pretty popular there. And one of the ways we actually looked at this is if you look at, you know, obviously this is true of all luxury brands where there's going to be different pricing across the different uh, geographies um, when you adjust for FX, but actually like Canada Goose in particular, if you look at like China and you look at the US relative to Canada, in Canada, this is actually significantly more affordable, even relative to other luxury traditional discounts on like the home territory discount. Obviously like Montclair is going to be cheapest in Italy, but the percentage discounts are higher. Um, and we think that that's indicative that Goose really has successfully rebranded themselves as, you know, this is a luxury product and this is something that people really want. Um, just, just to sort of add on, um, I know this isn't directly related to your question, Ethan, but I think it's really important that like, we want to emphasize that for this stock to work for us, we, Canada Goose absolutely does not need to become Montclair by like 2027, right? We think the setup is extremely asymmetric. EPS numbers have been cut about 30% over the past year, simply as a result of, you know, them seeing, um, you know, sort of this backlash in China and then people thinking that the brand equity is really impaired. When in reality, you know, we sort of go do the work of like, okay, here's where all of Montclair's locations are in China, as opposed to Goose. Here's what we hear about COVID lockdowns, right? The locations are clearly different. This isn't brand equity impairment. This is simply just, them not recovering yet. And then so, you know, you have this great China recovery setup where, you know, I think the story of this business cleans up very significantly in the next year and a half as sort of China reopens and people start to um, see that side of the business reaccelerate and people understand that this isn't sort of like a permanent impairment in the brand, but rather, you know, a really attractive China recovery story. If you want to play a recovery in that region, I think this name is like one of the best ways to do it. The fact that, you know, they've traded at an extreme um, premium to uh, Montclair and Burberry historically, but like sort of now that spread is effectively zero. I think it's like a great tell of that. All right. Can you walk through the China reopening? I, I guess, what are you going to track to make sure the thesis is on track? 
uh, for China, because it sounds like most of, I guess all of the eggs are really in this China reopening and success. So how are we measuring the success there? And, and um, at what point, if it doesn't, if whatever you're tracking um, um, doesn't play out, when do you, I guess, uh, what's the sell signal? Yeah, uh, so I think the the kind of setup is basically everyone thinks that brand equity in China is permanently impaired and people just don't like these jackets anymore. Um, and the the proof of that is in the last quarter, Montclair saw just really strong China uh, reopening dynamics and Goose did not. Um, so what we've kind of, I guess there's two ways we approach this. The first is we tackle the brand equity in China. So we look at a bunch of alternative data here. In the US, we'll scrape like the different wholesaler channels um, get pricing reviews, et cetera. It's a little harder in China, the, you know, um, just like a little more annoying about being able to scrape it. But there is, for instance, like we look at Baidu trends pretty consistently of Goose Montclair, um, of, you know, other like Bosi Dang, which is like a local Chinese brand. And then that kind of can give you an inflection, like how is social media engagement trending? And then you can also actually look at, you know, Weibo engagements. And this is something that we do, and uh, some of the sell side analysts that, that we've spoken to also do, where it's like, you know, how, what is the number of likes? What is the number of views? What is the number of follower counts? And, and we've seen that Goose has been incredibly strong, especially relative to brands like Montclair. So that's the brand equity side in China. If that slows down, then you're not ever going to get that China reopening benefit, right? If the brand is permanently impaired, then like that you should be out of the stock and kind of that's the point at which we kind of pulled the trigger as well. And um, I think that the second thing there is in terms of actually tracking China reopening by itself, obviously the, he the headline proxy is kind of your cases and lockdown days per quarter. But um, the more interesting, I think, alternative data is like, one, the outbound tourism story is super highly underrated. And so we'll look a ton at what's the number of bookings of uh, international uh, uh, flights out of China. And we'll look at those sorts of KPIs. And those are the things that we kind of look at. Whereas like in the US, we're really looking and we scraped kind of pricing reviews. We scraped kind of like resale values. Like you, those are less useful. Um, I think we've spoken to some investors on Goose who are looking at like Google Trends data uh, in China, which I thought was really funny given that Google is like kind of blocked. Uh, in China. So I think like some of the alternative data work here has been a little more like is what gives us a little more conviction. Yeah. And just just one last thing is obviously this isn't reflective of like all of China, but like to the extent that we can, um, we, we have found people that we at least know in China that will like regularly go take pictures of like the stores. And so we can see how like the lines are doing regularly, which obviously is just like one. Sunfire. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty funny for us. Um, that, that's the last thing we're doing. And and, you know, we think that like obviously if like China's a dud, that's an issue, but that's like kind of what's being priced in right now. So it's it's very asymmetric. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll let Vito ask the last question. I was just going to ask about channel conflict. Um, I noticed in your margin trajectory, you have a lot of that, you know, shift to direct to consumer, but I've seen it also go wrong, especially at first for certain businesses where their channel partners balk. And uh, there's, you know, even though everybody's focused on the direct to consumer, that wholesale business is really important for numbers. And it's almost like a trap door sometimes, and it could really mess things up. Just going to ask how, what gives you confidence that they'll be able to execute on the uh, shift from wholesale to DTC and how, how, how would you track that sort of thing? How yeah, it's going? That's been something that's like largely played out a ton already. So from, you know, 2014 when they launched e-com until kind of 2019 and today, uh, today like D2C is, you know, 50% of unit mix uh, around like 70%, 60, 70% of revenues. Um, and wholesales the remainder. So we've already seen the majority of the potential for that kind of wholesaler conflict, uh, channel conflict to play out. Um, I, I don't think we're really like betting on anything changing in that strategy. That's kind of just the continuation of them calling, you know, the same kind of never the wholesale channels. I think to some extent, to your point, it gets a little harder when like you have low hanging fruit that you call like the REI distributor and there's probably not too much channel conflict there. But, you know, when you start to look at, you know, a Saks or a Barney's like that um, is going to be a lot more interesting. What I would say is what we found is I think Goose has, they don't really just like close these doors immediately. They start to, you know, kind of prioritize certain SKUs and certain wholesale relationships. And then they prioritize like the more important SKUs to the retail and the launch new products through retail, things like that. So it's a little more smooth. And I think they've done a pretty good job and been pretty disciplined about managing wholesale conflict without it kind of seeing the wholesale side just completely resulting in misses. I mean, this stock like almost always beats numbers. 
Um, and like one of the things that we actually thought was interesting is like the last quarter was the second quarter in the history of their 30 quarters as a company that they've missed. And so, um, you know, just fantastic execution, especially on the part of Bain Cap and especially on the part of the management team. We think this is kind of a one off here. And we don't think that the channel conflict is something that's like a long term headwind. Thank you for your presentation. Um, we'll now move on to the next team, which is Boyd Gaming. Thank you very so much. Thanks for the Thank questions. Hey everyone, how are you? I think we're just waiting for the other two guys. Perfect. Great, you can start whenever you're ready. You guys okay. see the screen okay? Good. All right, good afternoon everyone. My name is Nadeem Gangat and I'm here today with Azam Gangat and Hardrup Singh. And uh, we're here to present our long thesis on Boyd Gaming. We're recommending a long with a uh, target price of $86.70 with an implied upside of roughly 50%. So we think Boyd presents a compelling opportunity to own a high quality free cash flow generative gaming business with the potential to unlock tremendous value through the separation of its real estate assets from the Boyd Gaming Opco. We think a spinoff of the Boyd's 24 properties into a REIT would, would uh, unlock some substantial upside more than current dividends and buybacks, primarily through multiple expansion from the REIT uh, which would also support more leverage, allowing substantial debt repayments and special dividends at the gaming opco level. We'll also note that the gaming space is no stranger to the opco prop or REIT split, and there are numerous case studies uh, that have created billions of dollars of shareholder value uh, over the past five years. Uh, we believe Boyd will generate four to five billion of free cash flow, roughly 75% of its current market cap over the next five years. Uh, and now the Boyd has deleveraged all this free cash flow will be returned to shareholders through buybacks and dividends. Uh, we think Boyd trades at a material discount to its peers at the lower range of its historical valuation range. And despite this, we think the real estate alone is worth the majority of its total uh, enterprise value. We think, you know, the casino market, the casino real estate market is performing re very well. We think it now is the optimal time to, to monetize the portfolio. And I'll end by saying, you know, post-COVID margins are structurally a lot higher. And we think that 37% margins are not temporary. And believe, we believe that this business has operating leverage. Uh, and we think it's earning, Boyd's earnings power has improved disproportionately relative to its stock price. So yeah, now to give a quick overview of the company, Boyd Gaming manages 28 casinos of which they own 24 um, and the remaining, the remaining four at least. And they operate primarily in Las Vegas in the Midwestern part of the United States. In total, Boyd has 1.7 million square feet of gaming space and they operate across 10 different states. It's also worth noting that in 2021, 80% of the company's revenues came directly from gaming, and less than 10% was derived from F&B and room revenues. The company operates various types of gaming properties as well, which include not only traditional casinos, but also riverboat casinos and racinos. And now moving on to the capital structure, the company has 2.6 turns of leverage and is valued at 8.2x EBITDA. And we currently believe that the company is very, val is, is, is very attractive at its current valuation. And this comes from the fact that we believe the current real estate portfolio itself is worth roughly $6 billion, implying that we're creating the opco at roughly 5.8 times EBITDA when peer gaming opcos trade at a valuation in the range of 7 to 11 times EBITDA. And we're going to be, we're going to be diving into this deeper, but just to, just to give a quick synopsis, we're estimating that the EBITDA for the propco will be roughly $472 million, and using the given multiples 13.3x, 12.5x, and 11.1x, which correspond to a seven and a half cap, eight cap, and nine cap respectively, we believe that the real estate is worth approximately $6 billion. And given that the current enterprise value is 9.1 billion, we can back out the enterprise value of the OPCO, which is approximately 3.2 billion and would be created at a multiple of 5.8X. And it's important to note that this a relatively cheap opco creation multiple includes a 5% stake that Boyd has in FanDuel, which we believe is a much higher quality business than DraftKings. 
So despite strong operational performance, board equity is down roughly 25% over the past year. Uh, and this includes numerous earnings beats, uh, three to be exact. Uh, Boyd's acquisition of Palo Interactive, which is an iGaming business for uh, roughly 200 million in, in uh, March of last year. Uh, a new buyback program, Boyd is you know, buying back nine or 10% of its flow annualized for the next uh, five years, in addition to a dividend. Uh, so when you think about all these factors, you know, the stock now trades at roughly eight times 2022 EBITDA, uh, which is the lower range of, of its historical multiple and uh, you know, this is to say, you know, despite the fact that the business trades at you know, record market, business now trades at a level where you know, we've seen record margins, has minimal exposure to sports betting, and has delevered significantly to you know, roughly two and a half turns of, of leverage. Yes, just diving into the valuation, Boyd has historically traded at around nine times EBITDA, so it's already trading towards the bottom of its cycle. We think that the closest peers to it are Red Rock and Penn. Um, just given their regional nature and similar asset base, we think that Boyd margins enhancements were going to persist in the short term and that a real estate spinoff is really the way to bridge this valuation gap. We also do think that there's a lot of embedded value in the FanDuel and Pala Interactive stakes. Um, and just, I guess, making a quick note on a recession case, revenues fell 10% for Boyd during the great financial crisis. When we ran this model, we got to an EBITDA of around $913 million, applying around 10 times forward EBITDA above their historical multiple. But we do think that their growth is likely to persist through 2023 and into 2024, and that EBITDA is going to be much closer to consensus 1.2 billion. We also just want to note that if we were able to separate the real estate from the opco, a lot of the gains from the real estate trading independently would offset a decline in a recession from the opco. So it'd be a nice hedge against a recession. So our proposed transaction structure, we think that a spinoff is the most efficient, top way to maximize the real estate portfolio value. Essentially, Boyd's Opco would enter into a triple net master lease with the Spinco and would pay $500 million, $560 million a year of rent payments, which is about two times coverage, which is what we've seen in a lot of recent transactions from GLPI as, lar as well as larger REITs. Um, effectively, by creating this REIT that's collecting the rental income, we'd be able to borrow money against it at around 30% loan to value. We would use these proceeds to then fund a special dividend at the gaming Opco to help with the 1% dividend deal, as well as delevering the Opco. We think that this is possible largely because REITs trade at much higher valuations than a standalone gaming opco, largely due to the fact that they own quality secured real estate, as well as the fact that there are tax considerations for owning a REIT as opposed to a regular C Corp. And as you can see on the right, there's substantial upside to be created through this separation, as well as the addition to improve shareholder liquidity through a special dividend. So one of the things we tried to spend a lot of time understanding is, you know, what happens if, if the spin you know, doesn't actually happen? So we think Boyd will generate four to five billion of free cash flow over the next five years. In our base case, uh, this business will generate six dollars and seventy cents of free cash flow per share in twenty twenty five, and trade at around a fifteen times multiple versus you know seventeen or eighteen times for comps. Uh, this is really due to the fact that we think the market will come to appreciate higher post COVID margins that are driven by you know not necessarily just one increased spend per visit, but primarily decreased headcount and reduced SGNA. Uh, so we think the equity represents tremendous value and offers investors a 12% free cash flow yield, uh, you know, in a business with a competitive mode, unique asset base and good management team. Uh, but this is to say you know, the stock is down 30% from July 2022 highs. And given the expectations of an impending recession, uh, you know, slow in gaming activity, margin compression, we think investors are exaggerating these risks. One point is that gaming is a very resilient and stable uh, space. If you look at the past 30 years, uh, COVID in 2020 was really the only outlier year for gaming. Uh, two is that a COVID recovery is not fully over, uh, and that business guests and conventions and international tourists, and particularly Hawaii, which has been a, a main point of, of focus for Boyd, uh, have not really returned to Las Vegas and Boyd's uh, other areas of operation. Uh, two, three would be that part of Boyd's margin uplift was driven by COVID pent up demand, uh, you know, stimulus checks and things like that. But the majority of these margin gains were driven by structural improvements and cost cutting. Uh, you know, management guides, mid 30s EBITDA margins through 2025 versus 20 to 25% EBITDA margins uh, pre-COVID. And this is primarily due to decreased headcount. So Boyd plans on using this free cash flow to buy back 10% of the flow per year, uh, as well as you know, possibly making creative acquisitions or, or paying additional uh, dividends. So Boyd emerged from COVID with structurally higher margins. Uh, last year in, in 20, fiscal year 2021, uh, Boyd's EBITDA margins were 37% uh, versus 25% before COVID. 
And uh, we think 35 to 40 percent margins are not temporary and are, dire are a direct result of two structural themes that we think are here to stay, which are greater spend per visit uh, and, and lower headcount. So SG&A specifically labor is Boyd's greatest cost. And you know, during the pandemic, the business really learned to operate with reduced headcount. And if you look at this graph here, uh, we've shown gaming OpEx as a percent of gaming sales, uh, which has trended down meaningfully. And if you think, you know, after two years, after two funky years of, of post-COVID business, uh, that that gaming OpEx should rise again, uh, we we don't really feel that way, and we think that management has not guided towards increased headcount at all. And if you look at uh, kind of the margins of this business, we think they're definitely here to stay, and there's real structural improvement as opposed to just uh, pent up demand from COVID. And, and if we think that was the case we think margins would have declined uh, significantly back to, to where they were before COVID by now. Okay, so now when it comes to valuing the proposed REIT, it's important to realize that you can't value casinos on a per square foot basis as you, as you would do for, for other types of properties. Um, instead, we determined the target rental income for the REIT based on a 2x rent coverage ratio, which is pretty standard in the industry. And after that, we analyzed REIT EBITDA margins um, throughout the industry, and we and, and we use a conservative 85% margin, giving us an EBITDA of 472 million. We then analyzed leverage ratios for GLPI and VG, and proposed that the REIT would support could support five turns of leverage at a loan to value of roughly 32%. And given that REITs um, have risen, we modeled in a 7% for our cost of debt, which yields 307 million in funds from operations, and then assuming a 90% dividend payout and a 6% dividend yield based on our comp set, we arrived at an equity value of 4.6 billion. And we just wanted to note that obviously for, the, for this process, when, when thinking about revaluation, um, we actually um, spoke to Professor Alan Feldman from Wharton's real estate department, who founded and was the CEO of, uh, CEO of Resource Street, which was recently acquired by BREIT in May 2022 for $3.7 billion to just talk about the assumptions and to make sure that the REIT valuation made sense. Um, and now moving into um, the, the OPCO valuation, um, we're modeling in $1.2 billion for 2023 EBITDA, which is currently in line with consensus numbers. And based on management guidance, as Nadine mentioned before, from the last earnings call, we're expecting margins to remain in the high 30% range. And as mentioned earlier, Boyd leases four of its properties. And for the, from those properties, it has a, a current existing rent expense of roughly 100 million, which yields us a pre-spent EBITDA of 1.1 billion. And after the incremental rent expense we would take on um, due to the spinoff on a rent coverage ratio of 2X, we arrive at a pro forma EBITDA of 550 million. And now given a multiple of 8X for this new opco that, we, that we'd be creating, we arrive at an equity value of 3 billion. And given the 960 million that can be paid out in a special dividend to shareholders as a result of taking on debt on the REIT while still keeping 50 million for working capital for the REIT, the total equity proceeds are roughly 4 billion. So I guess just getting into the iGaming assets a little bit. Um, Boyd Gaming owns 5% of FanDuel, which is the leading sports betting platform in the United States. It has doubled the market share of its nearest competitor, DraftKings. Um, I think it's really important to note that DraftKings is going to burn $800 million of cash, or it already has now, and is continuing to burn cash through 2023. We think that because this FanDuel warrants a higher valuation because it's business quality, higher market share, and the fact that it's actually generating positive EBITDA for Boyd, um, and just, I guess, one really interesting note, Netflix, if you look at Netflix versus Amazon Prime or Uber versus Lyft, there was a really interesting report put out by Flutter, which controls DraftKings, that shows that when a business has a significantly higher market share than its competitor, it's able to drive higher margins as well as grab more profitability into the future. Um, additionally, they own a stake in Pala Interactive, well, 100% of it, which is an iGaming platform. Um, which we've recorded at cost due to limited data on the investment. But we think that these investments as well give us additional upside and exposure to iGaming, which is a high growth business and contributes to our value um, for the business. So we've actually spoken to a lot of the holders in Boyd Gaming to try and think about one, is it feasible to separate the real estate? And two, have they engaged management just to get a better sense of the investment and our strategy? So we first spoke to HG4, which owns about four and a half percent of the business and Gates Capital Management which owns about another one and a half percent. Both funds own the business because they think the real estate assets are not appreciated by the public market. And when you run the math similar to what we did, the opco is created at a huge discount relative to its historical multiple as well as peers. They think that the real estate should be monetized now to offset how it's performed in the last year and significantly increase the dividend as they both said that the one percent yield is basically nothing. They're very comfortable with our projections for both EBITDA and rent coverage for the REIT, and have actually somewhat engaged management 
who, and they believe that they're much more open to being opportunistic and trying to monetize the real estate. Um, and they both had a really interesting line in both of our conversations. Anything is possible in game, gaming shareholder activism and noted Carl Icons as well as Elliott Management's success in the space. So I guess from a shareholder activism perspective, it is possible to win a proxy fight here, although that's not the best strategy we would suggest in this case. Um, some of the governance elements are really interesting to us. There's one share class. There's no special voting shares. There's no staggered board. The entire board's up for re-election each year. They don't have a poison pill in place and shareholders are able to call a special meeting um, given that they own the correct ownership in order to do this. Um, we think that these give you a fair shot of winning in a proxy fight. And we came through these terms by reading through the bylaws and proxy statement and think that the best way to win would be to get to get support from shareholders such as BlackRock and Vanguard, who are traditionally adverse to shareholder activism. But Boyd's already performed really poorly in the last year. And if you were to create a REIT, this would be a more stable fixed income like security, which would be active for these large funds in a recessionary environment. Additionally, you have pretty strong hedge fund ownership in this. Canyon has involved several other value-focused hedge funds um, who do agree that there is significant real estate value that can be monetized to reverse the recent performance. So we think really the best strategy is to talk with the board, given that they're substantially represented. Um, and man, they have added some new members in the last couple of years. We believe that there's a strong case to separate the real estate from the opco and think that just by bringing awareness to the situation, the public markets will begin to value the embedded real estate and can help bridge the valuation gap. So just to touch upon a few uh, risks and mitigants, one would be that credit markets have been tightening up. We believe the SpinCo should be able to borrow roughly two and a half billion to fund a special dividend and, and debt repayments at the OPCO level. Uh, while it may be difficult to secure this financing, we, we do know in our model, uh, you know, we assume 30% loan value and factor in a 7% cost of debt, which is well above uh, GLPI and Vici. Um, we also think that smaller sale leasebacks may counter this. Uh, and again, this is completely per management discretion, but we think ultimately the way that the way the puck moves here is a shareholder activist comes involved uh, and pushes pushes the board to you know either spin off the real estate or pursue a sale leaseback. Uh, and so you know the second would be the spin co sees indiscriminate selling. Uh, so investors may immediately sell their shares in the spin co, causing forced selling on the, and and so. You know, the spin co should have a purpose and a clearly defined business strategy, such as including strategic M&A uh, using excess free cash flow. Uh, as Azam previously mentioned, uh, the board successor resisted Elliott's uh, campaign in 2014. They also uh, pushed for a reconversion. Uh, we believe that their resistance will cost shareholders billions of dollars in lost equity upside. And we do think that a proxy fight is winnable and that recent developments such as strong real estate valuations uh, based on you know where we've seen precedent transactions and poor share price performance will make the board a lot more open to change. Uh, the fourth would be game, a slowdown in, in gaming activity. Uh, we think it's important to note that, that this business saw a 10% decline in revenues during the great financial crisis. Uh, and so you know this implies 913 million of EBITDA in our model, which would breach the uh, rent coverage ratio defined between the Remain Co and the Spin Co. Uh, but we do believe that real 2023 EBITDA will be a lot higher than 913 uh, million and that a decline in the value of the OPCO would be offset by the special dividends and the other value created from the, from the REIT. The last would be that the real estate valuations compress. Uh, we do know that casinos are one of the best performing real estate asset classes and currently trade very close to our NAV, very close to their NAV. Uh, to counter this, we used a higher dividend yield, uh, 6% as opposed to 5.5% for comps. Uh, we also used a higher cap rate to account for more real estate, more expensive real estate financing uh, and slow down in, in gaming activity. Okay, so yeah, just to conclude, you know, we believe that Boyd is very attractive at its current valuation as the real estate itself is worth a significant portion of the company's current enterprise value, despite having a thriving opco, making this a very attractive entry point. And we also think that, you know, when, when thinking about a spin-off, we have to make sure if, if, if it makes sense in the market. And so, you know, look, we, we, we did some research, um, um, you know, just to see if a spinoff would make sense. And we looked at the most recent Green Street um, re weekly pricing review from Jan 20th. And REITs are actually, and gaming REITs are actually trading at a premium to NEV of roughly 15%. GLPI's premium is 12%. VG's is 16.6%. But when you compare those gaming REITs compared to other apartment REITs, um, which are in general on average trading at a discount of roughly 20% to NAV and data center REITs, for example, which are a slight premium of roughly 3%, um, your gaming REITs have performed extremely, extremely well um, in, in, in these current markets as we're heading into recession. And so we think the timing of this makes a lot of sense as well. Um, 
And so, yep, that, that's our pitch and um, we'd welcome any questions. I just want to know why Elliot failed. What, what was the, what was, what, what was Boyd management's pushback? How did they fail? And I think you did a phenomenal job at summarizing all this. I just want to know why, why, what's different now? So I guess just getting into Elliot's uh, push, this was 2013 into early 2014 when the Boyd family owned more of the business. They were like in the low 30s at this, mid 30s at this point. They've gone down to around 20 because they've been selling the family. Objectively, they have gotten older and they've started to exit part of their investment. Um, they also added a new board member in 2020 or 2019, I'm sorry, who, you know, through our conversation with H.G. Vora, we were informed that is a lot more open to opportunistic. Like he was the one who suggested doing the buyback um, with all the excess cash flow they're generating to try and be a little more opportunistic with that. So the resistance to Elliot was largely because William Boyd um, really liked the security of owning real estate and having the physical assets in the business. And it went to a proxy war with Elliot. Elliot lost. Um, but we do believe that there is potential. Like you've seen Carl Icahn had a lot of success in Tropicana. And Starboard has been recently active in MGM, which was another interesting case. But we don't necessarily <clears throat> see the proxy war as the best way to win this just because it's going to be costly and it's, hint it's contingent on getting support from BlackRock and Vanguard. So we really think that just talking to the board, there are three Boyd family members on a nine-person board. The entire board is up for election. The best bet we really think would be calling the special meeting, talking to them about why the timing makes sense and how they would really create value. Um, I'm going to really pause value. you real quick. Why do you think the timing makes sense when the margin structure has been untested? If it really is, if if for Spinco, if it really for Opco, if it really has uh, permanently been changed, or if we're just over earning from COVID, and why would the timing make sense when credit markets, yeah, they recovered in, recovered in January, but by the time you got this done and you printed this and went to market, we could be in a full blown recession. I'm just curious, what, why now? Wouldn't it be better coming? you know, more coming out of a recession, just just to challenge that point, but now's a good time. We, we do think, I mean, let's let, if we pause and go back uh, five, six years to when Elliot's campaign was, uh, even though Elliot lost the campaign, uh, the share price went up, like went up a lot in the past six years. And so there really wasn't a need on management's end uh, or pressure from, from shareholders uh, to spin off the real estate. And so now we think, you know, despite the fact that credit markets are tight uh, and Opco is, is seeing, you know, is performing a lot better, uh, we do think it's important to note that the share price is down 25% over the past year, has an ins ins insignificant dividend yield, and all of its competitors have already done this and have seen tremendous results doing it. So we think that if not now, if it doesn't happen now or in the past year, we think once this business comes out of a recession, uh, you know, if a recession actually happens, then it's almost the perfect time uh, to spin off the real estate. But we do think, uh, you know, in, from now in the next 12 or 18 months, we do think an event will happen. Because I'm being tough on you guys, because the level of work here is excellent. OK, this is not undergraduate level work. This is this is excellent. So I am being tough, you, a little tougher on some of the strategic questions. Just want to know that. Just want you to know that. I appreciate okay. that. Yeah, I, I wanted to kind of just add in. Like, I, 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 I totally get what you're saying, right? Like, obviously, interest rates have risen up. Cost of debt is higher. Like, you know, we modeled in a 7% for our cost of debt. Um, but when, but it, especially given how gaming rates are performing, because typically for gaming, you know, they're, at least gaming used to be considered very, very recession-proof. And then, you know, like the past decade, there was a trend to add a lot more lodging. But, um, you know, and, and, and lodging certainly does not perform that well during recession. But at least for, um, for Boyd, um, gaming, gaming accounts for a, a very, very large percent of revenues and lodging is, is a very small amount. And, and, and then just based off the fact that, you know, it, like within the REIT sector, gaming, the gaming REITs are all trading at a, at a significant premium to NAV. We thought that it could be justifiable in this current market. Of course, it would be better if, you know, if we weren't heading into recession, but we thought even if we are going into recession, there, 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 there is still the opportunity to make shareholder value, if that makes sense. That, that'll be management's argument to you. If you push now, if they thought they needed security in 2014, they'll lean on the fact that you guys are crazy trying to do this. I'm just, I'm just telling you, that would be their argument now if, if, you, if somebody pushed it now, at least, in my, at least in my view. But I understand what you're saying. Trust me. I don't think you're wrong. I'm just saying that would be their, they'll lean on that pushback. as a pushback. Yeah. Yeah. That, nice, nice, nice presentation, guys. Um, some great analysis in here and thinking. Uh, echo, echo what Vita said. I had a question, I guess a lot of this thesis kind of just is predicated on the mispricing of the asset and just kind of valuation 
arbitrage. So I just wanted to press on that a little bit. Just you asserted that I think the asset portfolio was kind of comparable to the peers. And it just seems like these are probably more hyper regional and maybe lower quality assets on balance in terms of the like Hawaii based exposure in Las Vegas and riverboat exposure in Louisiana. So I just want to get your take on kind of like, is there a chance that this is actually just trading at a discount because it's lower asset quality? And then I think second, um, as you think about the just long-term headwind, potential headwinds in the business, like I know they have the iGaming stake, but have you thought about that maybe the, the sector's just kind of overheated from COVID stimulus and then the rise of iGaming is just going to take share from, from Las Vegas, like in-person gaming. And I know there's been expansion of, of uh, gambling licenses kind of around the country. And so just being Las Vegas focused too in, in tier B properties, how do you think about that? I think one of the things I'll add is uh, there were two recent precedent transactions that recently closed that we didn't include, uh, you know, in the precedent transaction slide, uh, where, you know, we had tier B assets that were acquired for 17 or 18 times EBITDA. Uh, in our model, we assumed 11 to 13 times. So we really tried to put, uh, you really try to be cons uh, conservative with the multiple assumption and left a big margin of safety there. Uh, so we think, you know, even if the multiple compresses and even if you make the case that, hey, you know, Boyd's real estate assets are B minus quality or, or C plus quality, which in reality, we think they're A minus B plus uh, range, which is where all the precedents took place. We think that, um, you know, 11 to 13 times multiple is more than reasonable. And those numbers imply 50 to 55 percent upside from here. So we were pretty comfortable with our assumptions. And we think that precedent transactions only point towards additional upside. Right. And I guess just two other points with that. When we built our model, especially for the Spinco remain co structure with the cap with the debt with the debt issuance to fund a dividend, we created this at around 30% loan to value, only just to be very conservative. We used a higher cost of debt than GLPI and Vici. And a lot of that came from our conversation with Professor Feldman, just about where he's seeing real estate financings occur right now. So we wanted to be as conservative as possible. We didn't want to juice our assumptions to like 50% loan to value just to make the upside higher. So we wanted to be conservative with financing, with asset quality. We also think largely because the REIT is going to have Boyd, game, Boyd as its like largest customer, that its credit is very important to look at too. And the bonds have traded very well. They're in the uh, low mid 90s. They have a BB rating um, right now as well. So we felt pretty comfortable with them as from a credit perspective too, when looking at the relationship between the Remain Co and Spin Co. Hey, oh, yeah, can I? Oh, go ahead. No, yeah, I was just going to say that, yeah, we, we definitely did take into account that obviously Boyd isn't going to be owning prime, you know, Las Vegas real estate as, as Vici might be. And, and, and so, so we did try to take a, a significant discount in, in, in terms of multiples that, that, that we think you know, like the op code have and, 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 and even the reach just by nature of the asset quality. So, right. Like we didn't expand the multiple at all in the remain co we kept it at eight X, which is actually like below where it's historically traded at a closer to nine. We didn't want to expand it from where it is today. Can I ask a question on uh, the margin structure you talked about, I guess on the remain co uh, part of the thesis, I guess if this is a catalyst driven investment, so if that catalyst doesn't happen, what are we left with, which is a company that um, uh, sh that you, you say had had uh, structural margin changes. Can you talk about, I guess, why you, we always talk about trust, but verify. So why do you think that these uh, margin uh, levels are, are sustainable? What do they look like versus peers? Um, and what did they do to be able, it looks like they cut, I don't know, I was looking at the employee numbers, 5,000 people um, out of, I can't find it anymore, um, out of um, 20,000 or actually, yeah, about 25,000. And oh, they, they cut about 10,000. Um, employees out of 25. And so what it, I guess, what's the capacity at the casinos now? Um, are, are they just running uh, at very high utilization? Um, where the service levels sort of kind of validate that these, this, uh, these margin levels are sustainable here? Yeah, so I guess I'll start by saying uh, comparables. I also saw a similar margin uplift. Uh, and we think, you know, 
roughly a quarter of that was driven by pent up demand, stimulus checks, things that were post COVID uh, with the remaining three quarters driven by structural cost cutting and, and decreased headcount. Um, look, I mean, 10,000 out of 25,000 is a pretty meaningful number. And just going through earnings transcripts and speaking with major holders, uh, you know, that leads us to believe that um, management really hasn't, ha really, management really hasn't noted uh, increase in headcount. They really haven't noted that at all in, in any of the transcripts. And so they, but they have guided towards high, um, high mar higher margins, high 30s going into next five years. Um, the, the other thing I'll add is there's operating leverage in this business. So um, when you have inflation coming and a fixed cost structure, um, you know, we think this business will, will hold up quite well. Yeah, and I guess just one thing I would note is also with management with respect to margins. I don't know if any of you guys have been to one of these casinos before. They used to always have free buffets. Um, that was a pretty big attraction. They cut all of that. And like loyalty hasn't changed at all. Like they've noted in their presentations and their slides, like people are, don't really care that they're gone. But that has also been like a source of savings. They've tried to cut back a little bit on like free food and drinks that are brought around like the casino floors. So just again, like they've been a little opportunistic trying to get creative about how to save costs. And they really haven't indicated that they're interested in making these um, offerings again. And they believe that they're going to structurally stay at around these margins, at least through 2025. I'll, I'll add, I really do think that if, a lot of this was just due to COVID pent up demand. Um, you would have seen gaming OPEX as a percent of sales go right back up to where they were before COVID. But uh, it's been, you know, two going on three years now where that has not been the case. Thank you. I think um, that's all the time we have for questions. We really appreciate your, your pitch. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. And now we'll uh, welcome the last team who is presenting Copart. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for staying on two and a half hours. You can start whenever you're ready. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mihir Bagul, and I'm joined by my fellow teammates, Jeff, Jason, and Aryan. We would like to thank you for the opportunity to compete in the Buy the Dip competition. It is our pleasure to be here, and with that, we'll get started with Copart. We are pitching a buy with a target price of $80, which would result in about a 26% upside. Copart specializes in the resale of used salvage title vehicles for a variety of sellers, including insurance companies and rental car companies. This industry is growing and will continue to grow as the number of cars that are not going to be repaired increases. Copart essentially is becoming this industry with a dominant online marketplace and enough land to serve as a significant barrier to entry. They have international and auction expansion plans, which will allow them to grow rapidly. And we really believe in this management team. They have a proven track record of past performance and success, and they have demonstrated their commitment to the business. Sorry about that. So let's just try and better understand what salvage auctions are. So uh, you have a car, you have insurance on your car, uh, and then you crash it, or maybe someone else crashed into you. And, you know, it's a headache for you, but it's also a headache for the insurance company because they have two options, right? They have an obligation. They can either fix your car or they can just write you a check, right? If they write you a check, they take possession of your crash car. And now what are they going to do with that? Well, ideally, they can sell it to like help recoup some of the losses. But, you know, insurance companies, um, they don't really know how to do that. Like they don't they don't really know how to do much except for calculate uh, insurance premiums. Right. So they're stuck with this car. What are they going to do with it? How are they going to sell it? Well, that's where Copart comes in. Copart comes in and says, we'll take care of that. So Copart is like the pipeline for the insurers to sell the total car. It's like the garbage disposal. So if you think how much would you be willing to pay 
for someone to take away your garbage if uh, it wasn't provided by the municipality. I think it would be a lot. And that's the essence of Copart's competitive advantage. So when Copart takes possession of these cars, they tow it to one of the 200 lots across the country. And then they go through the process of like processing all the DMV papers. And then they put it on their auction site, copart.com. They were one of the first to like ever sell cars on the internet. And in they started this in 2003. And okay, so just a couple of questions I want to uh, help answer, right? Who is buying these cars? Um, well, some people are melting it down for scrap. Some people are dismantling for parts. Some people are just rebuilding these crash cars to drivable condition. And second, what is this wholesale auction 20%? What does that mean? So the 80% is insurance salvage is what I just talked about. The wholesale is like when you trade in your Ford F-150 to an Audi dealership, you trade it in. Audi doesn't want your F-150. They want to sell that. So that's the wholesale, basically. And Copart earns a fee uh, on, these, uh, on these transactions for these various services. And now the question is, so I think there's three main ways that Copart can win, right? One is their core U.S. Uh, salvage business continues to grow, right? Number two is, uh, they take share in this wholesale auction market where they are not really dominant, but there's plenty of uh, share market share to take. And number three is expanding into international markets. Now, we believe number two and three, Jason is going to try to convince you of that. But fundamentally, this business is about the U.S. insurance salvage market. So we're just going to spend the next four slides to try and explain to you why we have a such exceptionally positive view on their core market. Right. So this right here is the core of the pitch. All this equation does is kind of break down the levers affecting Copart's insurance salvage revenue, which are incredibly straightforward. It's really just these four things. And to simplify even further, we don't expect to see much change in miles driven and accidents per mile. And while revenue per unit will likely decrease from its COVID highs, that'll be offset by increases to total loss rate. And the, the, the main way we defer from the street consensus on Copart is just the expected amount that RPU will fall and that TLR will be able to compensate for that fall. So diving deeper into total loss rate, it's basically quintupled in the last four decades due to a few factors. On one hand, vehicles on the road today are older than ever before, which means the ratio of their pre-accident value to their post-accident or salvage value is going down. Like when I'm driving around in my beat up OA Camry and get in a crash, that car is worth so little already that it's probably just gonna be totaled. And even in newer cars, repair costs have been increasing as fragile lightweight parts and difficult to repair sensors are becoming more common. Like it used to be that if you dent your bumper, that's fixable by just going at it with a hammer, but now you need to have a dozen scans done to figure out where the sensors are and if they need to be replaced and recalibrated. Then there's EVs, which are just a whole, like much more complex than any conventional vehicle on the road today. Like when a Model Y crashes, crashes on the highway and there's battery acid leaking everywhere, that car is probably totaled. And some EV manufacturers won't even let shops repair their cars unless they've been certified because of these safety concerns. Right, so Aryan just walked you through the volume story. And you, know, you can ask us more about that, but we're very confident that volumes are going up. But what about RPU, right? This the other leg of the thesis that the market seems to think is that, okay, used car prices have pretty much, um, you can see the graph, like they, they have gone up a lot during the pandemic. When they come down, all the Copart is, the R, Copart's RPU, the fees that it earns is also gonna come down. At least that's their thesis, right? But we think that this impact of falling vehicle price on Copart RPU is overstated, right? So in the table, we have what would happen if selling price on Copart fall 30%. Because that is, if used car price fall 30%, that brings us back to 2019, right? So number one, right? Even if Copart, all the sell price on Copart fall 30%, the RPU falls less than 30% in all cases, just because like there's a fixed component to the fee structure is not all variable fee based on the selling price. Number two is that we think that Copart's fees, uh, Copart selling prices are not going to fall 30%, even if the broader used car market falls 30%. And that's because the fundamental drivers of demand for these scrap vehicles, these beat up like cars that they're melting down for scrap or scrap parts. This different from people who are buying used cars, the general consumer who's buying used cars. And we have seen that this has been stronger. And I'm going to talk and come back to this later, right? Number three is that, okay, maybe some of the most expensive categories on Coparts, uh, in Copart will fall 30%. But you can look at the fee structure. Basically, the more expensive the car is, the less of 30% impact actually impacts them. Like a $15,000 car, the uh, price falls 30%. It doesn't even impact any of their fees that they're earning on, um, on this car. And number four, and this is the most important point, right? You can just take a look at this table. Like I don't have a mathematical measure, but it's very obvious. Volumes matter much more than selling price. Right for Copart, selling two cars for two thousand dollars—that's actually better for them than selling one car for fifteen thousand dollars. 
right? So do this whole, the street, every, all this noise surrounding this company is like, okay, our pews are falling. Our pews are falling. The used car price is falling. Our pews are going to fall. We think volumes are much more important to this, uh, this company's story, right? And then let me explain this volumes are automatic hedge. Well, what do I mean by that? So when used car prices fall, repairing becomes less attractive, right? If the used car is not worth anything, you're not going to repair, you're just going to total. So that's going to increase the volume for Copart, right? So even as this RP or quote unquote, the used car price are falling, well, we're going to see that volumes for Copart is going to go up. This is what we observed in the 2008 recession, right? The used car price went down, RP went down, but volume went up and that's enough to compensate for it. So we think that this, like the street is zoning in too much on RPU, which we think that is overstated anyways. And they're ignoring the fact that the volume acceleration is going to more uh, more than compensate for that. So now that we've talked you through the business model, let's quickly explain why we think that Copart is the best player position to leverage this business model to greater success. And this really starts with the network effect that Copart really kicked off when they transitioned to a 100% digital model in 2003. And the reason why this was so beneficial is because on, right from the get-go, sellers like the, the fact that there are more buyers on these digital networks. They can get a higher price for the cars and scraps that they sell. So they're more likely to transact on these platforms. And because they're likely to do so in the long run, because the economics are better, Copart has the time to maintain better relationships with these insurers and integrate their scrapyards more closely with these insurers like supply, supply chains, which means that when there's more suppliers on this marketplace, there's more buyers as well who are attracted by the variety, the more competitive prices, and thus give Copart a Rolodex of 750,000 buyers that they can utilize both within their domestic markets and like their mature markets, but also used to leverage in terms of expansion to other markets internationally as well. And I really think the proof in the pudding that is the most telling sign that Copart is able to successfully leverage this network effect is in the fact that even in a public market that we don't think fully appreciates the value of Copart's ability to win, um, and even in a market that is essentially just a duopoly between Copart and IAA, Copart is valued with a pretty substantial premium relative to IAA, which shows they're pretty good at leveraging the said network effect. We think another important difference to point out between Copart and IAA, the two parts of this duopoly, is in a bit of a difference in how they get into possession of the scrapyards that are a key component of how they conduct their business. So what IAA does is they just say, okay, so we don't want to pay the upfront cost for these scrapyards. So whenever they need a new scrapyard or they think there's an advantageous land position that they're able to get their hands on, they lease it out. So they do a 10 or 20 year lease and they don't front the upfront costs in order to outright buy the scrapyard. What Copart does instead is they say, okay, so we think this scrapyard presents an attractive long-term investment. We're going to outright buy the thing. And we think that although this costs more initially, it presents a lot of long-term uh, benefits for Copart. So for example, if the land appreciates because they make a good bet, instead of having to pay higher rent, they get to keep that land appreciation and they get to lock in this prime real estate so that nobody else can access it. But let's say the bet was wrong, right? The scrapyard isn't that good. It is far easier to sell the scrapyard than it is to sell a 10-year lease on a scrapyard, which means that they have relatively more liquidity on the asset and more optionality in both cases. And I think all all this boils down to one really important data point, which is that the land position, the 200 scrap yards that Copart has managed in the past 20 to 30 years, this portfolio of scrapyards would simply not be able to be started if you wanted to do a Copart 2 right now because of new zoning regulations, because of geographical and developmental differences. Like the portfolio that Copart has locked in is not replicable today, which is one of the key moats and the reason why Copart continues to compound against the additive value of buying more scrapyards instead of leasing them out like IAA. So now that we've shown why we think they're doing so well in the current market, let's sort of shift the conversation to why we think they're positioned to continue to grow. And a lot of this comes back to the fact that they shifted to 100% um, digital auctions in 2003. So they started the music, they got the party rolling. And now as wholesale buyers are embracing this shift to digital because of the fact that like COVID happened and there's less costs and they're able to cut, cut out the auctioneers, 
um, Copar is specifically very well positioned to benefit from this broader industry shift. So we think this doesn't just happen within the United States market where they're outcompeting IAA, but also within like Germany, Brazil, and UK, where they already have established presences that are rapidly growing. And in terms of the near-term opportunities, we think, for example, in a lot of these other countries, there are tons of small mom and pop scrapyards that simply do not have the scale or the network required to properly capitalize on the value of their like their land positions. On the other hand, Copart constantly has access to all of its buyers on its marketplace, which means that they're better able to outcompete in all these markets that they're trying to expand within. We think this presents a great long-term growth opportunity for the company. And I also want to briefly touch on management because they're pretty good at what they do. Um, they typically maintain a pretty conservative capital structure, and that's because they generate a ton of cash, and they take this cash, and they just throw it right back into buying more land. So typically, about 80-85% of their annual CapEx budget goes into land, and the return on incremental capital is a pretty healthy 35-60%, to 60%, which means that historically, they've been pretty good at using the insane amounts of cash that their business generates to reward shareholders, increase the value of their stock and also reward themselves because they are significant holders of their own company's equity. For example, their CEO is paid in only stock options. Right. So this is our, this are just the assumptions we made for our valuation. Um, I would like to say that we have, we, we have reasons for these numbers that we put here, but I think it's, it's in general, it's very clear how we're getting the upside is that we are more positive on volumes than the consensus, and we are less negative on RPU than consensus. That is like that is quite frankly how we're getting this valuation, right? But you know, I I again I really want to just zoom back in on the RPU thing because this is like this just seems to be the area of most pushback that we get uh in this thing. Like, are they have they been over earning, right? And sorry, I just go back here. We're modeling about a 10% decline in RPU for the insurance in 2024. But didn't we just show you that RPU falls to 10 to 20%? Why are we only modeling negative 10%, right? So it just it just goes back to this, right? So there are sort of two. Two two legs to this stool. It's a structurally unstable stool. There's only two. I wouldn't want to sit on it. But one of the one of the legs is that they can raise fees. So all that we talked about, oh, the fees are declining, the RPU declined 10 to 20 percent. That is assuming they don't raise fees and they have raised fees. They in fact they rose fees about six percent in uh, November this year. Literally nobody cared. There's not a news story on this. One's like sell side report was on published on this. They did it over Thanksgiving. IAA also did it over this time period. Like. It just seems to be a very logical industry because insurers really can't turn to anyone else except for Copart or IAA. So that's one leg of the stool. Okay, they can raise fees, right? Second leg of the stool is that we, again, we don't think that the, we think that the demand drivers that are supporting the price for Copart's uh, selling vehicles are just different from the broader demand drivers for used cars, right? People especially their international buyer base, which is just not appreciated. 40% of these vehicles are sold to international buyers. Why do they want these vehicles? Why do they want these garbage vehicles? It's because they can rebuild them to like repurpose them in their home markets. It just adds a lot of value for them. So that is why there's like a fundamentally stronger base of demand that there is for these scrap vehicles than used cars in general. And we see the proof in the pudding. So over the same period this year where Mannheim has down, the Mannheim index for used cars, it's down 11%. Copart ASPs are actually up 6% over that same period. So it just it just for the evidence that supports that their ASPs have strength beneath them. And, you know, the, the street seems to think that this is something that cannot continue. We believe that um, for the reasons of raising fees, their fee structure and their fundamental strength and demand for these scrap cars that ASPs and RPU will remain strong. All right. So there are two key risks that we have highlighted for Copart's operations, which include the growing presence of autonomous vehicles and the potential failure of international market expansion. We've been promised autonomous vehicles for quite a bit of time now, but to be honest, they just aren't there yet. There have been countless reports of autonomous vehicles getting into serious accidents. So for a solution that is supposed to reduce human error, it hasn't been that effective. Then there's the question of what happens if Copart can't rapidly acquire land outside of the United States or is unable to establish those strong relationships with international insurers. We aren't worried. They have a proven success in the United Kingdom where they grew that business to 15% of the size of the US's business in just eight years. The management team understands what it takes to achieve these long-term goals, and we believe in their ability to do so.
To wrap up the pitch, we think it's made, we've made it clear the reasons why we think Copart represents a great investment right now. We've talked about their competitive advantages. They're benefiting from the volume tailwinds despite the analysts' noise about RPU. Um, we've talked about potential growth opportunities, and we've also given a little bit of insight into why we think their management is so great. As a whole, what this company is, is it's a growing, compounding, stable, free cash flow generating business, which is incredibly beneficial right now. And we think we want to end with a quote from the Copart management themselves, which is basically, historically, whenever they look at any scrapyard, um, at the moment, they think, okay, this isn't a great investment. There's better places to put our money. We don't know why would we invest in the scrapyard. But then 20, 30 years later, they look back at the performance and return of that scrapyard, and they think to themselves, wow, this was a pretty great investment. And we think that's really representative of what Copart is. Um, they are a collection of scrapyards poised to benefit from a ton of great trends. And although they seem a little expensive, we think they are poised to outperform in the long term and make a great investment, especially within this current macroeconomic environment. Thank you. So we'll open it up to Q&A now. I just have a, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the scrap value for EVs. Are they as high as uh, regular cars just because they don't have the bumper, the muffler, all that stuff that scrappers usually want? So you're asking about the scrap value of EVs? Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So, we so yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Like the what are the impact of EVs on this company? So it is possible that the people who are trying to like rebuild these cars in international countries, like foreign markets, they they don't necessarily want electric cars. They want internal combustion cars. So from that respect, like they could be less valuable um, for those types of buyers. However, like we also believe that uh, electric cars are like a positive on the side of like total loss rate and more volume going through. Uh, their platform and also like to the extent that the mix of cars in the world is switching to electric and cars in international markets people still want these like um high quality american salvage vehicles that are internal combustion engine like though that will like increase that value for those uh, buyers um we, i also want to add that like Right now, um, they've done they've done some analyses on like the difference between like scrapping internal combustion engine vehicles and EV vehicles, and although it's like slightly better in terms of recovery rates for like internal combustion engine vehicles, we think this is also a product of the fact that people have been scrapping these vehicles for much longer. While people are figuring out, like for example, the best way to extract some of the more like valuable materials from the used lithium ion batteries or get the copper out of the EVs, which is why we think that there's a bit of a discrepancy, but it is rapidly decreasing over time as EVs continue to like, I guess, increase within the vehicle market. What if they announced, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Teddy, go. Go ahead. Um, what have the competitive dynamics been like with IAA, your largest competitor? Like, what's the relative market share of each of these? How, has anyone been gaining or losing? And has there been any developments with IAA that would make you think that those might change going forward? I guess I can start off with this one. Um, right now, the market within the U.S. looks about like, I think it's about 83% is dominated by IAA and Copart, um, and they kind of, as like right now, split it half and half, but Copart is gaining on that. And I think Jeffrey can provide more color in terms of how specifically they're doing so in the scale to which. Yeah, right. So like they, both of these sort of win business on like their relationships with insurers. So uh, Copart has had a number of like notable account wins over the past couple of years, including like Geico, Geico in 2019, like they, they sort of have these, rather exclusive relationships with uh with these um insurers and you know to the extent we can actually monitor their progress of like how how fast they're gaining and you know part of that is down to like the whole network effect the liquidity right like why would you why would you want to sell your car your insurance salvage car on IA when Copart can get you higher average selling price which is a metric that they that they emphasize and also Copart has been really emphasizing you know the customer service where it's like okay we can if you have 25 cars you need to get rid of we have the delivery network. We can take that away for you like right now. And we have a yard that's close to you. And that's sort of like the, one of the main advantages that uh, sort of like they, they build on. They really focus on customer service as a means of like winning their market share versus IA. 
Got it. That's helpful. And how do you think, do you have any view on sort of relative pricing between the two? Uh, do you mean like value, like valuation or like the how like much pricing for, so if I'm an insurance company, oh. is Copart more expensive, less expensive than working with IAA? And like, how much does that factor into my purchasing decision or my sort of partner selection mm -hmm. process? Right. So um, when you're an insurer, right, you hand these car off to Copart or IAA. So like they, it, Copart or IAA, they never actually take ownership of the car at any point during the process, right? So they just sell the car and they give you what what the car sold for minus some fees, mm -hmm. right? So, but there's still like your question is, right? How, how, what about those fees? Like, are they, are they the same for IAA versus Copart? Answer is they're very similar. Like they, mm -hmm. they honestly, on a fee basis, like they, 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 they charge pretty much the same amount, the same cut. And those like the relative pricing has remained like pretty stable. Um, so again, like in terms of why would I go with Copart over IAA? It's again, it's like everything else. It's all the other part of the customer service, which is towing the cars, being able to tow the cars to the salvage yard, um, being, you know, being able to yield the higher selling price on the platform. When you actually sell the car, Copart can get a higher price than IAA. Uh, and yeah, in fact, yeah, I think that's that's helpful. Thank you. It's helpful. I was just going to ask about, um, you know, I thought you did a, you, you said it about the margin structure and you think what the street has wrong that they're not over earning. I, I'm just curious, do you, do you have a chart or anything that shows historically, or you could just walk me through it, how much have their margins increased um, since COVID versus sort of the margin trajectory pre COVID, just to get a sense for, how much the margins actually are up, why people are worried, so worried about it. Right. Um, trying to pull up my, uh, my valuation here just to see what the, what the margin is. And um, yeah, you'll, you'll actually find that like the, uh, the, the margins have not, have not actually like increased dramatically over COVID. Um, you know, part of that is like, Oh, but you know it is true that selling price have have increased right so wh where is actually the fear coming from it's because like there's also been like cost inflation for copart over this period so like even though their selling price have been going up like not necessarily their margins it's not reflected in like a hugely boosted margin but still mm -hmm. investors are concerned right like okay you have your revenue is boosted because of these selling prices uh but your costs have also gone up right when that revenue falls then your margins are also going to fall um uh, so, so I guess like to answer your question, like the margins have remained stable for that reason. Um, okay. What are their, what are their costs? Um, right. That so, gone up so yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah. So in terms of their costs, one of the major costs is that um, during the pandemic, uh, basically they, they're supposed to tow these vehicles away from their insurers, right? When insurer gets these crash cars, the Copart takes care of towing the cars away. And like they, they don't charge the insurers for that. This Copart assumes their responsibility. They used to have like these networks of like third party contractors that would do the towing for them, but those like got heavily disrupted during COVID. So what Copart had to do is like they had to suddenly ramp up their own towing operation, right? They had to hire their own tow truck drivers, right? Um, that is like that is a, a threat to their margin. But again, it's it's sort of like they have to do it to maintain that like. 30 years of customer service relationship they have with these insurers. They like, we have your back. Okay. Our, our tow truck drivers, like we, they, they quit during the pandemic. We are going to hire people to fill that gap for you. That's pressure on the margin. And the second pressure on the margin is that in terms of catastrophic events. So for example, hurricane Ian, um, when that happens, those insurers are loaded up with like a whole bunch of crash cars. And then Copart has to like install surge capacity to be able to deal with that. So those on, on, on net are like actually, dilutive to copart margin they increase the cost however it again it goes back to the customer service right when insurer wants to know that when i have a natural disaster and i sign my my contract with copart copart is going to be able to handle like this this surge right and that's like one of the main reasons why they they remained like they have this competitive positioning because they're willing to always focus on customer service even if it means like slower margins in the short run uh like then that's like they're always building towards long-term uh, long-term view so the fear would be that it's, it, how much of that cost creep or cost increase, you know, how slowly that goes away or how long it takes for them to absorb it versus how quickly, you know, that that insurance reimbursement rate comes down essentially from used car pricing. That's that's where the controversy is, if, if you will. 
how that trade, what it looks like for the ultimate bottom line margins. Have the, has the company given guidance for the year in terms of margins? What have they said? Uh, I don't, I don't have the information for you. Uh, but um, I, I think that like they, in terms of uh, like our perspective on this is that like they're, they, these are costs are like necessary to like as, in a certain, certain extent when it comes to like maintaining their customer service and in terms of like their revenue, right? We think that we have a stronger perspective on that because of like the volume acceleration that we're feeling uh, versus like the, like the RPU falling. We feel that the revenue, that aspect is going to be stronger than what the consensus is. So that's going to like support that. Okay, they have made any comments on like the earning the quarterly earnings calls or anything where they try to give in some at least their opinion on it. Um, yeah, I'm I, I have just I have, okay. have the answer. Okay. okay. I think we have time for one last question if anyone has one. Have you given any uh, thought to uh, basically the used car dynamic? Basically, the uh, I guess the inventory on on the roads today is probably a lot older be, because we haven't had um, uh, I guess because of the supply chain stuff, there hasn't been a lot of new car inventory coming online. So, what kind of impacts will that have on the next you know year or two? I can I can take this question. So you are right, like, for example, during COVID, right, like, all these car manufacturers just thought to themselves, okay, no one will ever buy a car again. So they stopped producing cars, or at least they stopped making the orders for the chips to put in the cars. And then we saw a lot of supply issues in terms of getting cars to people. And therefore, we saw a lot of older cars on the road. And we think this is incredibly beneficial to Copart, just because these older cars are worth so much less that it's much more likely that when you crash an older car, um, you just want to total it and scrap it and then sell it on Copart completely. And even though like analysts are like, okay, well, this means that they will demand a lower RPU. Um, we've, I think we've proven pretty clearly that volume is the biggest driver in terms of bolstering Copart's top line. So we think that this trend of like rising vehicle age is one that really benefits Copart's positioning even more than what the market thinks. So that chart on the left, I guess it seems contrary to what you're saying because I guess the share of accidents declared is going down significantly even post reopening. And that's the US, right? Yeah. Okay. So so it's yeah. it's lower than it has been since I don't know, 2007, 18. Right. So why would that be the case? Right. Even post COVID. Yeah. So what happened during COVID was again like the whole um acceleration of used car prices. Like when the price of used cars go up, right? Then it makes that the the repair option more attractive relative to totaling right if your worth used car is actually worth a lot uh, you might you might actually take the step of repairing it so that has like that was enough to overcome like the impact of like aging vehicle fleet but you know as we see the normalization of used car prices which is again the source of all this investor fear regarding rpu right when we see that coming back down then like we see like the then it turns back to like these fundamental drivers right the the aging vehicle fleet and the increasing vehicle complexity like that's why we're positive on the total loss rate long term okay i had one other uh one other question if there's time megan sure oh, for sure yeah maybe the last question for me i guess the the pricing offset impact like the ability to kind of increase their take rate i guess is an interesting mitigant to i think some of these concerns that we've been circling how do you think about like the price sensitivity here and just the dynamics of these these bids that it sounds like they had success passing through price this year but this is kind of a very unique year with inflation and, and all that but what's your level of confidence in their ability to just kind of like take true price in go forward years to mitigate some of the the arpu erosion that they may see Uh, yeah, right. So they, they uh, we mentioned we gave this example of the fee increase in November, but like fee increase actually does happen about like once, um, once every two years, like it's just sort of like a regular cadence. Um, and yeah, we, we are, we're, we're fairly confident in that because if we go back to like the, okay, right, we have seller fees and buyer fees, right? Seller fees, like they, 
it's th those are the fees charged to insurers. Again, we mentioned how they have like very strong relationships with insurers that they build over years based on like these years of customer service. So at least they can charge as much as IAA and probably more with that regard of increasing their fees on insurers. But in terms of fees on buyers, like this goes again to where are you going to get these salvage vehicles that are like beat up and you want to repair them for uh, like, or you want to be rebuild them to drivable condition, or you want to scrap them for parts, like Copart for an individual buyers. And again, a lot of these 40% international buyers, these are literally like individuals in like Ghana or something. They, they want to buy these cars. Like that is not a, I don't think that's a fee sensitive environment. Like it's more of a, like, this is one of the few places they can actually get these cars to serve their purposes. So for that reason, like we're fairly confident on their ability to pass through fees. And also to sort of add color to that, um, like a lot of this fee sensitivity comes down to the service that like Copart provides in terms of like, how can they like get me access to more buyers or sellers? So as we see more market consolidation in any particular market that they operate in, Copart then has more ability to like move their fees around as they see fit, which we think is another long-term benefit of their business model of actually buying this property and maintaining these relationships. Thanks. Great, thank you for the pitch. Uh, I think that concludes our event today. And again, we thank everyone for coming and for all the hard work on these pitches. We've really enjoyed watching all of them and listening to our judges' feedback. And we would also like to thank all of our judges as well for spending their Saturday afternoon with us.